And this is a podcast designed to help you become the man or woman you could have been and live the abundant life. Today, we have a remarkable guest joining us. He, he's a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Born in September 24th, 1977 in Los Angeles. Kabir, tell me how to pronounce your name, Kabir. I don't want to put Kabir, Kabir Baja, the G is silent. Baja Biamilla. Kabir, Kabir Baja, Baja Biamilla. There and his go. journey began with a passion for football and a foundation rooted in the values of his Nigerian heritage. He excelled at football at San Diego State University and transitioned into the Green Bay, to the Green Bay Packers, becoming a defensive force, earning Pro Bowl honors, and setting franchise records with 74 and a half career sacks. Wow. His journey doesn't end with his retirement from the NFL, though, because in a remarkable turn, he embraced a life deeply intertwined with his faith and community. He is... Now, I'm going to get this wrong because this is what it says, a devout Torah observer. He is actually a black Jew or, or just a Jew. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not only a family man, but he also pr practices a unique lifestyle, having multiple wives. And he resides in a communal setting, which we're going to talk a little bit about because he's part of a, a church named called Straightway. And we're going to talk about that as well. But um, his, his, his journey is uh, his post football journey is a testament to his unwavering commitment to his faith. And as a member of his church straightway, he navigates his life with a perspective that extends far beyond the football field. His dedication to faith, family, and community stands as a compelling example of a life lived authentically. Welcome to the show, KGB. Yo, thank you so much for having me, Rob. I'm glad to, to be here and, and talk about this topic here. This is exciting. So I'm glad you reached out to me and I like the work that you're doing and uh, like uh, you, what you're promoting because we need to start provoking people to start really thinking biblically Yeah, what the Bible says about biblical marriage. So I really like what you're doing. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. I, I originally found you when I discovered this information about plural marriage, biblical marriage, however you want to frame it. Um, I found a couple of your videos and, and I was like, you were just spitting truth and I could feel it in my spirit. So I knew I had to reach out and I actually reached out to your pastor, which I had told you about before we started live here, went live here uh, Pastor Dow, because I found some of his stuff and I was like, I got to get him, on, get him on the podcast and get him talking. I had Pete Rambo on the podcast uh, mm -hmm. a few episodes ago, and he's about to do a debate with us uh, with some pa some uh, pastors that are misinformed, I'll say. <laughs> so, yeah, man, we're, we're, I'm doing my best to get the word out because it's life changing stuff. So. Yeah, let's let's just dive in. Tell tell me because I originally when I told everybody I was having you on, I said that you were a Torah observer, mm -hmm. and, and I said something about the lost because I knew it was, had to do with the Jews and lost tribe of Israel, and, and I've heard Kanye West actually talk a little bit about this. So, real quick, tell everybody you know you, you consider well, yourself a Jew. I I I, I, I believe in, uh, in 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 knowing my spirit that I am a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite by blood. Uh, I was, uh, but uh, we were, we were told that we are Yoruba from Nigeria. Most people say, or oh, you're Nigerian or you're Yoruba or you're African American, but really we're Hebrews. Every, everything points back to the, uh, the, uh, the Israelites, uh, the sons of Jacob. Uh, so, and I was a Hebrew practicing Christianity in this country. Uh, I identified as a, a Christian at one time. I practiced Christianity for 16 years and, um, after after uh, 16 years of Christianity, I came into the truth, uh, the Most High. Yah gave me a dream. I had a dream. Literally, um, you know, I was uh, wondering if I, you know, I love him. And I knew he loved me, but I didn't know if I loved him. And in that dream, he basically said, you don't love me. And then I would be tested. And then that's when I, the scales fell off of my eyes and uh, I discovered the true Sabbath. And, and I remember looking into it when I was in Christianity, but no one ever wanted to talk to me. But once I found out about the Sabbath, the next day, I'm not making this thing up. The very next day, I saw a video by Pastor Dow, uh, who's, the, who's, our, who's my pastor at uh, Straightway Truth Ministry. Mm -hmm. He had some videos talking about the Sabbath, and he was just using the New Testament. And he, I mean, he was literally like, I was convinced. I'm like, man, I knew what he was speaking was truth. Right. And it was so compelling. I, I never done this to anybody I listened to. It was so compelling. I wanted to go down to Tennessee. I'm in Wisconsin. I wanted to go to Tennessee <laughs> and, and, and go visit how they do the Sabbath because he never really told in that video how to keep the Sabbath. 
I reached out just like you did. I called. Now, you, one thing about straightway, you got to keep calling. <laughs> and I kept calling, calling that that I think that uh, that that uh, Friday, his blog talk radio, the Sabbath night. I gave him a call and uh, was able to set up a time to go and meet him. It was July 1st. And then uh, 21 days later, uh, I was scheduled to go out there. But my family left me after that, after the 19th. So that's when I had my Job moment. And uh, the rest is I'm here where I am now because of that. But that's kind of how I came into the truth. What year was this? This was in uh, July uh, 1st of 2017. Okay, so July 20, uh, July of 2017. So you said you practiced Christianity for 16 years before that. Were you raised in the Christian home? No, uh, actually, I, I yes and no. I grew up in a, uh, uh, my mom was a Christian, but she started off as a Muslim. Both my father and my mother are uh, born and raised in Nigeria, Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria. They're both Nigerians. Uh, really Hebrews, but I'm just using the term, but they're both Nigerians. They came to America. I was born. Um, and you know, I'm just getting sure. it. yeah, but they were born and, um, I guess my mom converted to Christianity. So I grew up in a Christian Muslim home, but I grew up my whole life going to a Nigerian Christian church. But during the time of Ramadan, this is the, the, the holy month of Islam Muslim. That's when I would practice, uh, Islam, my Islamic faith. My dad did try to teach us Arabic and took us to Arabic school, but it was very hard to teach us Muslim uh, Islam at that yeah. time in America because there was just not a lot of resources out there. We had no mosque there in yeah. LA. And so we just end up just practicing Christianity. But when I went to San Diego State, I, when I left my father's uh, house and went to school, I, I took on and started practicing Islam on my own uh, while I was during my, my stay at San Diego State. That must have caused some conflicts between your mom and dad, I'd imagine, having different faiths, right? No? Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a normal practice in Nigeria. Uh, you have people who are Muslims and, you know, you, know, you, you serve who you, who you practice. You, you know, you serve God the way you worship God. So they, they can have a cohesive life because really the, what really bonds them is not the religion. It's more their culture, their Nigerian culture, the Yoruba being part of the Yoruba tribe. Is the is more of a stronger bond than their religious in gotcha. that in a sense. So yeah, that's what bonded them together. And and my mom coming from Islam understood that stuff. So it wasn't like the typical Christian that people grew up in this country. Like I said, I went to a Christian church. I didn't go to a white Christian church or a black Christian church. I went to a Nigerian Christian church, which is different yeah. from all the yeah. stuff I just described to you. So uh, but yeah, so that's in. So then when I got to the Green Bay Packers. Uh, just to kind of tell how I became Christian, that's when I converged to Christianity. I, I, you know, I had, you know, chaplains talk to me. And I remember, you know, accepting Jesus Christ, you know, as my mm -hmm. master, my savior. I used to say Lord and savior, but my master and savior. And it was in September of uh, 2000, 2000, September 26, I accepted him and, and was committed to following Jesus all the days of my life. And I've been doing it ever since, even though I was doing it in the form of Christianity. But as I came into more of the truth. Uh, uh, now I don't identify as a Christian anymore. I'm yeah. not even a Christian. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Um, but obviously, you're, you believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Yes, and he died. Yep, yep, he died on the tree for my sins. Yep, right. Gotcha. So, was was your dad polygynous or no? My dad was not a polygynous, but his father, my grandfather, was a polygynous. My great grandfather, my great grandfather, was a polygynous. They had four wives. My grandfather had four wives. So my dad grew up he had 15 siblings he's mm -hmm. one of 15 siblings and he had three he had four different uh four different moms obviously he had his mom but he had also had and because i remember asking my dad i said dad what did you call your your other dad's uh wives he said mama i said what do you call your mom mama i said oh okay <laughs> so, so so my dad grew up in a polygynous home where um so he that's that was his lifestyle so this is very and I knew that, to be honest with you, I never thought polygyny, even as a Christian, I never thought it was wrong. I remember bringing it up. Not that I cared because, I, you know, I grew up in a in a monogamous home, mm -hmm. just my dad and my mom. But I, I never thought it was wrong. To me, it was normal. And I remember I used to talk to my uh, my wife at the time. I used to talk to her about it. She said, no, it's wrong. And, and, and I could tell Christians at the time, just like, it was like, ugh. Like, it was like, so I, it, it was no, it was a mute point. I mean, you can't practice it illegal in this country to right. do polygyny. So it was no reason to really talk about it. But I never thought it was wrong. You see it in the Bible. Yeah. You see, you see David. You see Solomon. You see Abraham, Moses. I can go through the, the whole Bible. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I never thought it was wrong, but. I, I got a sense that Christianity really th just really frowned upon it 
Uh, and so I just never really talked about it or, or anything like that. So Yeah. So let's talk about a little bit like you transitioning from traditional Christianity to straightway. Mm -hmm. So like, what was it that Pastor Dow was saying that really resonated with you that was different than what you were hearing in other places? Well, you know, as a Christian, I was big on filter everything through the word. I used to teach my sons and daughter, you know, every time when people talk to you, test, the, even if an angel come to you, test everything, you filter everything through the word. And so I was really big on that. When I would talk to Christians, I always went to the Bible. I always went to the Bible. And I was pretty good from a Christian point of view until I met my match with Pastor Dow. So Pastor Dow comes in and I'm talking about he's straight book. He's, he, ooh, sorry, sorry. He's, he's, sorry. he's straight word. And and Pastor is very masterful with that book, with the word of Yah. It's 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 in him. It's it just spews out of him. He he coughs the word of Yah. <laughs> and so but when he was talking about it, everything he was showing, he was showing Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. He showed what they did after Jesus uh, uh, died and resurrected and, and went on. He showed how the apostles met on the Sabbath day, how the how the Greeks, how the Gentiles and the, the Yehudins, but they say Jew in the Bible, how they met to, to see the word, how even Paul, that was his custom, three Sabbaths in a row, he came back and was sharing the scripture. I'm like, wow. I, because, you know, in Christianity, they don't really point to that. You know, they'll just say, oh, that it got moved or somehow or whatever. So from there, that compelled me to say, because because like I said, I had a dream. So you got to if you take that dream out, it's just a Sabbath moment. Right. So I would have just probably, you know, glossed right over it. But what made it so powerful for me was because the night before, which mm -hmm. happened to be a Sabbath, which I didn't even know at the time, I had a vision or a dream. And, and I'm not one. I mean, Rob, I'm telling you, I'm not one to say God talked to me. Yeah, I, I can, God only spoke to me one time that I've actually heard a audible voice. I'm not the guy. Oh, he talked to me. Oh, yeah, I woke up and God told me. That, mm -mm. But the one time he talked to me and it wasn't like a, oh, a, a, a fuzzy feeling. His words were very terrifying. He says, you don't love me. I'm like, no, God, you know that I love you. I'm here pleading with him. You know that I love you. He says, you will be tested. So now my head is on a swivel. I'm like looking like, OK, OK, I know I can pass this. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to show God that I love him. The first person that said, I just got to get one person in my back pocket and I got this in a wrap. This is going to be it's going to be one of this. It's going to be one of these type of tests. I'm going to pass the test. Like I get one person. And at that time, I was trying to get my ex-wife. I said, hey, I know we're going through some tension with the whole head covering and the image of God, but I need you. I'm, I'm telling her, I need you. She could see it on my face. Just follow my lead. I don't know where this is going to go, but just follow my lead. And I'm thinking like, okay, good. She, you know, she's a Christian. I'm a Christian. Okay, boom. And then the next day, boom, that came up. And I'm thinking like, okay, this is biblical. There's nothing wrong with this, right? Okay. And then all of a sudden. Well, you say this, what do you mean? Sabbath, Sabbath. I mean, oh, it was, Sabbath, it was, okay. yeah. so I'm just following, I'm only following pastors. So I didn't really watch pastors, other stuff. I, from that video of the Sabbath, I called him. Well, what I did know is pastor, he brings it raw. I mean, he, he does not spare. He spares not. He brings the truth. Now, my wife at the time, she did more research and, you know, if you, and I'm assuming you looked up straightway. And if you do some research or straightway, what comes up? Call this yeah. that i want to talk about some of that yeah, I to, yeah definitely i yeah. want to talk overcome some of those misconceptions but go yeah. keep on yeah so all that happened and so i'm not knowing what she's doing behind the scenes she's telling people yeah you know he's looking into this cult thing and i'm not even knowing so anyway this is july 1st july 7th i get into, I, I talk to pastor dow i kind of i kind of say hey pastor uh my name is Muhammad. I used another name of mine which is actually my legal name but i said Muhammad, and then we talked on the side say hey I, you know i'm a I play football, but I would like to come and, you know, check out your, your ministry and see how you guys do the Sabbath. You didn't really talk about how to practice it. You, you, you convinced me. I'm convinced it's for today and it's not done away with, but I want to come see it. He said, well, you got a large family. Come on down. So I told my wife, hey, I know we have, you know, the uh, the Noah's Ark, uh, the Creation Museum. I, I'm assuming you, you if you're a Christian, you would know something like that. No, of it. I've never been. OK, but I, we've been we used to family vacation there. So we were going to go down there already. So I said, hey, it's down in Tennessee. We're going to go first to go check out Straightway and then come back up to Kentucky. It's right by Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And so I told my wife, hey, we're going to go. Donald Driver at the time. I don't know if you know who Donald Driver. He played for the Green Bay Packers. He got inducted into the Packer Hall of Fame. Be, me being a Hall of Famer myself, but we got invited. So I got two tickets. Me and my wife, we're going to go there. 
Dude down the driver stuff, boom, support him. He's our teammate, great dude, boom. And then from there, we're going to go head, head on the road. But this whole time, she didn't want to go. She, she said, I am not going. I don't feel this is of God. She got the elders involved. You know, if you really want to hear the story, you can go to my channel and check sure. out. You'll see it in raw. But the, 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 the gist of the story is that she didn't want to go. So by the time we were getting ready, the week, the week that we we're going to uh, uh, before the, the Hall of Fame, she t- her she took my uh my seven uh seven children at the time and took off and left and hid at a pastor's house for 40 days so she, I, left. she left because she, she left she i went to go do meet with some clients came back home my family is gone called the christian church called everybody everybody just went dark on me they just ghost everybody pastors elders everybody is like and you've been tied into these. This is what trips me I out. Tied is billions of dollars, Rob. Yeah, this is what trips me out is people like when I start talking about this, they're like, you're perverting scripture. You're being influenced by the enemy, all this stuff. And I'm like, they don't know. They don't realize how carefully I've lived. I'm so I take the call of God so seriously on my life that I would I would not do anything that I wasn't feel like I was being led by the spirit. I mean, I'm looking at you. You're your faithful ch- ch- attendant church. You're tithing a, a lot. I'm, of money. I'm a deacon. I'm a deacon of ten percent of your of of millions of dollars you're giving to the church, like you're supposed to. Like these people, that, half the people that are in my comments, they don't they don't you know they're out fornicating and they're telling me that I'm wrong. And I'm like, you realize you actually are sinning, and it's clear in the Word of God, right? Like I compare my sexual track record to you know just about any of y'all, but I'm I, so I'm looking at you and I'm just saying like, here's a guy that's really devoted to the Lord based on how you're living. You got you know, and then. You're feeling the Holy Spirit leading you. And then she bounces, which honestly, because, you know, people, I told people I was having you on and somebody's like, isn't he the guy that abandoned his family? And I'm like, I don't think it went down like that. But that's not even a biblical ground. Like she might have disagreed with you, but that's not biblical grounds for her to leave. Well, she had the support of five, you know, because I'm because of who I am being KGB, whatever you want to call it. You know, I was very involved in the Christian community in this area, very involved with the radio station different churches gave money i mean i was i was like mr christian if you see my past big on christianity gave a lot of money to the christian cause and now when i needed help usually i was helping the church now i'm yeah. asking for help and they did like i said they went ghost so is they, it all because of straight way yeah be, and, and this is before polygyny i'm just gonna let you know i know we talk about polygyny yeah, but yeah. Had nothing to do with polygyny i didn't even know that straight way practiced polygyny knew nothing about it all it was is about the sabbath that was it. The Sabbath. I, now I'm in a Catholic community. So Catholics really have an issue with Sabbaths. I didn't know that. I studied the Spanish Inquisition and, and uh, the canons of the Catholic Church or the ch- Christian doctrine. I said, OK, ooh, I did not know. If I would have known what I know, I probably would have. I just thought, like, oh, Sabbath, what's the big deal? Uh-uh, it's a big deal. They, they, mm-hmm. they, 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 they say you work on the Sabbath, but that's a whole nother story there. But the long story short is she left. I'm, you know, and and it, it was a Joe moment. The best way I can describe it and just sum it up, I had a Joe moment. The worst thing that could happen is my wife went the other way. I lost all my children who I, you know, loved. I was I was big on focus. I was a I was a supporter of focus on the family. I'm, I'm assuming you heard of focus on the family with Jim Daly. Before Jim Daly was uh, Dr. Dobson. I mean, I was big on it. Listen to all that stuff, and even, I even talked to Jim Daly. All all of them supported her. Would have supported her over my situation, try to call for counseling, no help. And so anyway, with her doing her thing, I, I kept saying, I gotta follow this. I gotta see what, it was kind of like the matrix. I gotta see how deep this rabbit hole really goes. And so I just kept going and then in there, that's when I ran into polygyny. And then that's what, but to me, the polygyny wasn't even a big deal. I'm yeah. like, I mean, I could have had a bunch of women back in the days. You know what I mean? Women came up to me doing autograph signing and stuff. That So it wasn't like a, it wasn't my thing. I, I was okay with being a one man doing monogamy. That was perfectly. I was perfectly comfortable with my one wife and my eight, my seven children. To wow. be honest with you, but um, but what pa- some of the things that Pastor was bringing up the, about the law and this, it was just different things. Those are stuff that was really tr- you know really getting me to start looking into the ministry and see. I mean, this ministry is really biblical. They got power. They they speak in tongues. They cast out devils. They lay hands on the sick. I mean, they, they they are literally like when I went to go visit Straightway, the piece that passes on to say they are literally leaving the living this book 
They're doing community according to Acts chapter two and mm -hmm. Acts chapter four. They have all things in common. I'm like, dang, it's like walking. Like I told you, I go to the Creation Museum. Forget the Creation Museum. <laughs> Creation Museum has nothing on straightway. You go to straightway, you're thinking you're walking in the Bible. Like wow. it's like, wow, women in their role, bro. I'm talking about women. They, they'll say, yes, sir, yes, sir. I mean, they they treat men like kings. It's 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 beyond. It's just like brothers hugging your neck so hard. They greet you with kisses and hugs, holy mm. kids, hugs. I'm like, they're literally doing what this book is. I've read the book eight times and I've never, I've never seen, you show me one Christian church that's doing what Straightway is doing. I will leave Straightway Church and go join that church. And mm. I, I don't think you will find it. Yeah. And so so then when polygyny came in, Pastor even introduced me at the time. I, and it wasn't like Pastor was hiding. At the time, he was practicing, but he wasn't promoting necessarily. Mm. So when I came on, uh, came there, he, he introduced me to his, obviously, I knew his first wife, uh, Mother Carol. And then he said, oh, this is my second wife right here. I said, oh, OK. He wasn't. I, Pastor's a, a, a very humble man, meek. I mean, when you meet the, like his personality on TV or, or YouTube, is not the man that you meet. <laughs> he's a very, I mean, he is a loving man. He is a, I know it's hard, but he's a humble man. He's a, yeah. he's a quiet man, believe it or not. And so what did it for me, for polygyny now, what got me to start thinking about polygyny was now we have a situation here on hand. I lose my family. My, my Hold wife. On, before you start this, because I know I just want to do one quick thing. Okay. Hey, we got about 80 people on here right now. Do me a favor. Everybody, uh, Drop a comment if you haven't yet. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you would, feel free to share this episode. We're going to get into some heavy stuff that's very important that the world needs to know about. So feel free to share the episode. But uh, yeah, drop at least drop a comment. Say hi. And if you if you feel like it, tell us where you're watching from. I did want to say also, so before I forget, you said Pastor Dow was practicing it, not promoting it. I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm promoting it right now. I'm not practicing it yet. I don't know if I will. We'll see. Yeah. But I, I did see some of Pastor Dow's stuff, and he was. I love this one. I was watching him, and he was talking about fat preachers. And he was, <laughs> he was using the word fat over and over. And I was like, I love it because you know what? You can't even. It's like people won't even say fat anymore for fear of offending any somebody. And I, I did like. I did really appreciate that he was he was spitting it direct. Um, right, well, wound from a friend is better than a kiss from an enemy. Pastor will love you. <laughs> and you will be provoked into love. I'm telling right. you, you, you can either love him or hate him. And I love my pastor. He's he's like a coach. He's like that tough coach that and he knows how to encourage you. When when I was down, I remember when I when my family left, he said, son, he says, OK, hey, what you going through right now is hard. Losing your family. That's a hard stuff. I need you to I need to get your head up, put your shoulder back and I need you to close the door. You go in there, you cry, you cry your head off. But when you come out. You need to stand on that word. I mean, I mean, like it was like I, I remember saying, "Yes, coach." You know, he, <laughs> the way he was talking to me was like what a coach would when you're going into a game and it's tough. And so, like I said, Pastor, I mean, I'm alive today because of what Yah did uh, was doing through Pastor Dow. Pastor Dow literally saved my life, my physical mm -hmm. life. I was depressed, you know, losing my family. I was isolated. I was left. Or dead. And that the, the whole goal was for me to commit suicide. I'm just telling you that right now. The spirit this, of suicide came up. Were you depressed huh? before the family left? No. I, okay. I, I, everything was good. I mean, I you yeah. know, like it was just it was sudden. It was like a like when I say it was a Job moment. It was a Job. Job wasn't depressed. Yeah. Oh, Job, Job, Job. Your house. Job, Job, Job. Like it was like like this. My life in in a twinkle of an eye. Boom. Gone. Come wow. on. Where's everything? call it. I mean, just, it just, and so oh. it, it was a Joe moment and the only person, and there was some other people, but pastor Dow literally called me every day, checking on me. And this is a busy man. If you know, pastor schedule, I don't even talk to him as much as I did, but he called me every day. And there was a moment in that after a few months, after he says, it sounds like you got it. Cause I start getting my strength. I start looking, he says, you know, he, him being a military man, he could probably tell I was kind of doom gloom type of moment and he says it sounds like you got it and he's the one that inspired he says you should you should tell your story you should tell your story on youtube and that ended up becoming very healing for me to just to okay. be able to express what was going on sure, so. sure i just want to say uh feel free to drop questions in the comments we may try to get to them at some point um you mentioned that that straightway was called uh, a cult I, I do want to get into that but i want to mention that christians were called a cult 
You know, I know. the Romans used to say that Christianity was a sex cult. So, like, I, I take I actually almost take it as a compliment. You know, people used to call City Fam a cult when I after I started. I was like, eh, they're just trying to describe something they don't understand. But mm -hmm. go ahead, tell me the story about the polygyny because I you shared that with me and I, I mentioned that in one of my stories recently about how that came about. Because people are so quick to say, oh, it's just sex. They, there's people who are sex crazed. They just want to have sex. I'm like, people are doing that now. <laughs> if you want to have sex, why the hell would you get married? Like, that just is going to limit. You got to take care of the person. You're responsible for them now. If it was just sex, why why would I need to get married to them? So I, I really loved your heart behind that, that story. I, I would love for you to share that now. Well, um, the, 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 what got me open to polygyny was after losing my family, I am a financial advisor by trade now. And we believe in diversification, right? You don't put all your eggs in one basket or one company because if it goes down, it's done, right? So you have to understand, I was very, when I, I'm just trying to just build this up. I was very involved. I was I was like a, a poster child for Christianity. I, I, mean, you, I was the spiritual leader. I tithe. I, 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 when we vacationed, we found a church to, to go to on Sunday. I mean, I made sure... My children, they could only watch Christian channels, Bible movies. We were on the road. If You know, they said, you know, tramp your child when you're walking along the road. The only thing they could watch in the car was a Christian cartoon. I mean, everything was revolved around Christianity, focused on the family, right? So, um, so for me, I put a lot of time. They went to Christian schools, never stepped foot in a public school, went to a Christian school, solo scripture, all of that stuff. So to me, I'm thinking like, man, I put all that time in there and it was based off of one woman. One woman was able to tear that whole thing down. And what happened was what I found out was that I built my house on sandy ground. Yeah. Christianity, Christianity was the sandy ground. I built this beautiful home, but it was on sandy ground. Mm. And now that I've come to the truth, now I'm building my house on solid ground. And now I got the, the Torah, the prophets, the gospels, the epistles. I got all of this to now work with. I'm not limited to just the gospel or the New Testament. I got all of the scriptures, all of the word now. And so I told myself when I, the next time I'm married, I am going to now practice polygyny. So I already went in before my, the next woman I got my uh, sister Bree now is my woman. I said, I'm going to practice that. And whoever comes into my family needs to know I will be taking on other women. And the reason why, just logically speaking, in the flesh, I'm going to diversify because women are unstable. They, they're, they're very, they're emotional. They're unstable. Uh, one of the mistakes that I made in Christianity was, and I fell for the trap, was I got the marriage license. So that's what made it Sandy Ground. I got the marriage license. You don't give your strength to a woman. That's what mm -hmm. it says in Proverbs 31.3. A mother is telling her son, who's a king, do not give your strength to a woman. You can see in Proverbs 31, 3. Well, by me getting the marriage license, it literally gave the woman the strength to destroy kingdoms, to destroy my whole house. So that was mistake number one. So I told myself the next time I get with a woman, there will be no government involved because the government do not care about your family. Nor is it their responsibility. It's not their responsibility. And so I, I told myself, I'm not going to do that. And so when people say, well, aren't you doing something illegal? No, it's only illegal if I get two marriage license. I'm not getting any marriage license. I will be legally single for the rest of my life. I only have one legal wife and that'll be it. And now, now we divorced, but that would be it. So I told uh, uh, Bree who came in, I said, hey, I will be, I, I, I joke around, but I kind of mean it. <laughs> so we'll see if it's true. But I said, I plan on having 94 children. And I remember she said, she says, we're going to need help. Exactly. We are going to need help. So, because she knew she can't produce 94. And so that's what made me open to it because I wanted to diversify. I just want to say 94 is your football number. I was, <laughs> in case you all didn't get the joke, that was his Green Bay Packers number. Go ahead. But I'm getting close. I'm at 12 right now. So I'm working, I'm working that number. Dude, right that's now. a, that's, a, that's a, a nation building right there. You're building your own, your own football team. <laughs> I got nine boys, three girls, but we, we're getting there. So, um, so now, um, with the, with the, so how I got into it after three years of being with my woman in the truth. Now I've been that straight way. I'm an elder there now. And, um, I had a sister. Now I have actually knew this sister longer than I know my, uh, my woman. And when I say woman, just so for people who are hearing this stuff, that's wife, but wife is a legal term. So I try to stay away from legal terms, but try to, so if I say woman, that's what I mean. My woman that I, that I have a covenant with a covenant relationship with. <laughs> But my woman, I was with her for three years 
And uh, but but be, while I was with her, there was another woman who came, uh, Pastor Dow. Once again, I got to, you know, uh, people say, why you keep mentioning pastor? But I got to mention the truth because I can't tell the story. But my when I was in Christianity, they told me to put my dad in assistant living, you know, like because uh, uh, he's getting old. He's, he has Parkinson disease. He was living with me. And during the time I was in Christianity, Christianity, the pastors were telling me, hey, Kabir, they were kind of trying to tell me in a nice way. And, and that's why I just learned about Christian. They're very cold hearted. They said, hey, you need to be focused on your wife. The Bible says, leave your father and your mother. This is what they told me. Leave your father and your mother and cleave to your wife. And that's how they justified assistant living. And they said, well, Kabir, in the Bible, they didn't have assistant living. But now that they have it, you should use it so you can focus more on your wife, focus on the family. See, I believe now I don't focus on the family anymore. I focus on Yeshua. So it's not about the family. It's about Yeshua. It's about him first and then mm. everything else follows. Mm. So my dad was an assistant living for the last two or three years. Before, you know, right this. So when my woman left, my, my wife left me, my legal wife left me, Pastor Dow, the first thing he told me, he says, hey, uh, uh, some brothers, we start, we put our stuff together. We start fellowship and we end up starting a little community. And pastor said, hey, your dad should not be an assistant living. You get your father out. We will send you a sister to take care of your dad. I mean, this is the pastor telling me, "Get, don't worry, we'll get you a sister, a single sister that can help you to take care of your dad that knows how to take care of only. Said, great. So all the brothers came and helped me. We got our dad out. I'm not paying $3,000 a month anymore. So that was saving 40 grand a year. So I got my dad home. I said, dad, we coming back home. He was happy, but bro, my dad, he's a Muslim, okay? He, to this day, he has so much respect for Pastor Dow because he didn't want to go in. He begged me not to go. I said, Dad, you're just around the corner. I'll take care of you. He begged me. So he was he was real happy when he finally got to come home. And I really believe him coming home, it allowed him to live a longer life than he would have if he was in that assistant living, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. And I'm not saying the assistant living is bad. It's just not good for people to put their family in. Yeah. So anyway, I brought in the girl that came in. There was a girl that came in. She, she told me straight out, I want to be your concubine. I said, okay. And pastor said, don't sleep with her. I was like, pastor, you don't have to tell me, you know, <laughs> she's not even, I mean, she's not my type like that. I mean, I don't prefer her anyway, but if it works out, it works out, but she can't work on that. Well, you know, long story short, she quit three months. She says, okay, this guy, cause she was trying to, you know, do some flirtatious thing. And I just wasn't budging, but I mean, I'm, I'm very disciplined on that one. So she quit after three months. And I'm like, dang. And we back to get, we thought we were all happy and, she left, and then Pat, and then um, then uh, Elder Mitchell. There's a there's an elder in our ministry called Elder Mitchell. It's actually Pastor Dow's uh, son-in-law. He reached out to me. He's part of another community, Straightway Community, in, in, in another community is is a it's in Kentucky. And he calls me, and he's like trying to say, "Hey, uh, God put it in my heart. Uh, we have a sister. We know you have a need. This is the type of love you get at Straightway." Um, she's a single mom, she's a widow, and she got two children. He was really trying to let me know. She got two children, and you don't have to take her, but I just wanted to offer. I'm like, bro, we'll take her. But he was, he was, you know, I mean, this was, this was a different woman. There's a new woman because this is the replacement. Okay, because I, I thought when you told me the story, it was the first, the first woman. No, not the first one. But it so was the first one was trying to get with you too. The first one, no, the first one, the second one, I didn't know about the second one, the, the one I'm with now. The first one told me straight up she wanted to be with me. I was said, she, okay. was she yeah. a single mom too? No, she was just a single sister. She was Okay, she was just a single sister and she was yeah. wanted to be wife number two. Yeah, but the other yeah. one, the really story, the part of the story that touched me was the the what the one that you have now, number two, or you know, second yeah, wife, the, mm -hmm. the second woman that came along. Mm -hmm. She had two kids. And how, how were they when you just made this decision? And tell tell that story about how those kids reacted when they heard. Yeah, so, so, so the, the, the children was like, I think I want to say five, uh, I want to say five or four. They were young. Yeah. Now they're nine and 11, 11 and nine right now. So, or 12 now. So it's, they've been here for a while since 2018. So forgive me on the numbers, but I don't know the numbers here. But so anyway, so when I finally decided to, uh, to take this, uh, take this woman on. Now you have to understand, uh, Rob. I did, I wasn't attracted to her like that. I, I didn't, you know, there wouldn't be a, some a woman that I would have naturally preferred from the get go. It wasn't like, oh, God, that girl's look, you know, it wasn't even that. I saw her here as a sister. I treated her as a sister. I was a father to her children, uh, because as the head of the community, it's my job to 
covered to take care of any of the single sisters. Who are they going to go to? So sure. as, the, as the head of community. And so if the children need a discipline or any type of talking to, you know, they need a man figure. So I kind of played brother, but I was really a father to those children. So they, they had all their needs met and everything. So as time went on, I eventually got another woman, got married. She's, she's with me this whole time. She actually taught the woman that came to help me with my dad actually taught my my woman, Bree, the, 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 the first one now. Uh, she actually taught her how to take care of my clothes and things of that nature because now she's new. So now we got three sisters in the community held from a different house now. Not mm -hmm. my, but there's another brother. But anyway, long story short, so now she's living with me this whole time with another. She sees me with this other woman, but she's wondering who's going to want to be with me. Who's going to yeah. cover me? And, and, you know, because I'm the head of community, she's getting counseling and, and, and people are coming to me and say, Hey, I'm interested in that sister. I'm interested in that sister. And cause they have to go through me to, to, to kind of figure that out. And then one time pastor did something on his blog talk and said, Hey, Kyrisha, that's her name. Kyrisha. She said, um, she kind of put it out there that, you know, she's a sister out there. Boom, boom. And so everybody started hitting up pastor and say, I'm interested. So I put my bid in and said, pastor, I'm interested. And the reason why I was interested not because of the fact that, oh, she's fine or that. It was more like, whoa, wait, if guys get her, guess what? I'm going to lose my caretaker for my dad. Dude, I love your honesty. Yeah, Thank you know, you. I'm, 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 and, just, and the reason why I want to be honest is because I want to show you how Yad did a work in me. Yeah. So when so I was thinking like, man, she's a good, she's a good sister I, because I got to know who I'm laboring among. She loves the most high. She loves him. She's passionate. She's a good mother, a good sister. And I didn't want to lose her and not at least give an opportunity to put my bid in, right? Yeah, man. I put my bid in, but then the only the only the 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 stipulation for me that I was struggling with was wait a minute, she sees my dad's nakedness. And the Torah talks about something about these types of relationship. But after further review, we looked at it, it was more about her my dad not seeing her nakedness. But it never said anything about her seeing his nakedness because you know she has to help him out and stuff. So once I got the green light that I could cover her, I love that. Then pastor said, hey, take her, but take her as a concubine just to play it safe because we're still trying to understand the Torah as yeah. we live this out. We know in part. Right. Yeah. And so anyway, so when, once pastor finally gave the green light and you know, I'm just speeding up, but she gave the green light. I told Kyrisha and, and, you know, we eventually had to tell the children and I told her first and we worked it out and she was happy, very happy. And then I told the children. And because the children kept asking, when are we going to get a dad? When are we going to get a dad? And so I said, hey, guys, I got good news. I said, uh, hey, your mother's going to be covered. I'm going to be covering your mom. And they're just like, Baba, we got a dad. I mean, they, you know, because there's other children. There's other children in the in, in the community. You got a dad. It, it was just, bro, it was like we won the Super Bowl. Yeah. And, and, and in our culture, in, I mean, I say Nigerian culture, but it is a, a language. You're about culture. Instead of saying father, we said Baba. So they used to call me Brother Kabir, Brother Kabir, Brother Kabir. Now it was Baba. And they kept saying Baba, 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 Baba. Every moment they could say Baba, 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 Baba. I said, okay, calm down. Like they were that excited. And then they and then um, DeAndre, my son from Kyrisha, but uh, he came to me, he says, Man, my, I say, mom, how's mommy doing? Mommy is very happy. She has been happy. Like they could tell that she was just happy. And, but you know what was so cool about this stuff? If I can rewind just a little bit, during the time when I was transitioning my mind to cover this woman, I had concerns. Can I love her properly? Sure. Being that I didn't necessarily prefer her, right? Right. Can, I'm not necessarily attracted to her physically right now, at that moment. I'm kind yeah, of going yeah. back there. And I remember taking a shower and I'm just praying like, God, is this is this of you? Because, you know, and, and I said, but God, I'm not attracted to her like that. And, and, and I remember something dropped in my spirit. God looks at the uh, man, looks at the, uh, the outside, but God looks at the heart. Mm. I went to my dad and I told him what I was considering. And I said, but dad, you know, and he says, you're, you're, you're concerned about the face. He said, you're concerned, of, you're concerned about this stuff. He says, she's a good woman. And the reason and, and I'm telling out of any woman I've ever been with, my dad is not a talker. Out of every woman I've ever been with, this is the first woman he's ever endorsed in my mm. whole life. And the reason why is because she takes care of him. <laughs> so she understands. I mean, she got to do a lot of nasty stuff to, sure. to get my dad. And so my dad, so 
I had confirmation in the spirit and I had the second witness with my dad that says, you know something, I'm going to cover. And I'm glad I have because my, my woman, Kyrisha, is like she's a diamond in the rough mm -hmm. and she's an amazing sister to my uh, my first wife. Um, and I said first, of all, but uh, Brie, I yeah. mean, she has been a huge support to her as she transitioned, because even for my for first wife, she's she's an amazing woman. And even though this has been not an easy transition for her, and I'm just being honest with that, because she grew up in America. They all came here, but she grew up in America and she was taught the Cinderella story, one man, one woman only. But she loves me. She loves you She loves me. And she's here, yeah. she, you know, and she's she's working through it, fighting all the lies that she'd been told about monogamy and being said and seeing the selfishness in, in her own ways. Yeah. So I commend her. Some people say, well, how come she's just not overjoyed? I said, you know something? There's some people that can fake it and say they're overjoyed, but I know she loves me because she's still here. Yeah. I, and she's still doing my will. Yeah. And what did Jesus say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yes. In my Christian marriage, guess what? My, my first wife would say, I love you. I love you. I love you but never was obedient, never did my will. There was a 40% chance she would do it or not. Right. This one, don't tell me she loves me, but she does my will. Yeah. And I know she loves, I know she loves me. And so I'm proud of her. And obviously I'm happy about the, I'm proud of the second one I got. So you can see that. And I had the resources too, uh, Rob. You have to understand that now, I'm, is this means that polygyny is for everybody? No, polygyny is not for everybody. I was talking to somebody today. Polygy is not, I'm not saying polygy is for everybody. I could afford to take care yeah. of her. I was already taking care of her already. The yeah. only thing we add is what? What do we add, Rob? Commitment. Well, commitment. Responsibility, oh. covering. You mentioned already, covering. But I was already doing that. The only thing that we added was sex. sex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was sex. And now guess what? She gave me a beautiful daughter. And and y'all willing, she's going to give me another one. She's 37 years old. She's even, even her range. She's yeah. Beautiful. So I just want to mention a couple things. One, yeah. I want y'all to make note of how committed he was. He was so committed to the point that he was worried about something that he read that <laughs> her seeing his father's nakedness, that he wasn't going to go down that path. And then he had to go back, research. The script. I'm like, I don't know many people that are that committed. Like that's some serious level of commitment right there. And, and the fact that like you made a pragmatic decision, I don't know that love was supposed to be this fairy tale. I'm going to fall in love one day. And like, no, it was like, Hey, she's a good woman. She needs a covering. She's helping me out. Boom. We're helping. You. And that, that, I mean, isn't that what the Bible says? Like your brother's widow, or, you know, you, marry the brother's widow, give her a baby because we want the name to live on. That wasn't falling in love. That was a pragmatic decision. This is your responsibility. You do this because this is the right thing to do. So like, I just really, in addition to the fact that I learned that the odds of a woman over 35 years old, that she's divorced or widowed, the chances she's going to find a husband are not in her favor. They're actually against her. And the older she is, the worse they are. Now, this woman's got two kids. That makes it even harder to find them, much less a good godly man. You know, like they might find a pagan to marry him. But we, I, we look at this imbalance in the church, 20 million more women than there are men in the church. And then we wonder why a woman goes out and dates a man that's not married and marries a guy that's not a Christian. We scratch our heads and go, I wonder why she did it. like what are she gonna do grow sit around never have sex again not have any have anybody cover her and i love that you use that word because that's really what it is is god wants women covered he wants a protector and you know the, the fact that you're able to do that for her and her kids when one in three in children in, in, in christianity how do they take care of their widows how, I mean, from all they're your experience to, in christianity how, how are widows taken care of in the, in the christian church they're supposed to remarry if they're under 60. I know, but how do how have you actually seen it in Christian churches? Oh. Widows being taken care of in, in the Christian church? Maybe like a small group or something. I don't know. Small group or right. you know something like that. We take care of our our, our, our widows. They, they 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 are taken care of. We don't tell them to go to the government. We cover them. Either they'll be in the community. And this woman, like I tell you, she was she was single for eight years. She was yeah. a widow for eight years. No one was covering her, but she, the, the, but the church was covering her during that whole time. And yeah. now she has a man. Well, I love And you said that she's still here, too. And I just wanted to point that out because the kind of man that you have to be to be able to be a polygynist, you have to treat you're going to have to, number one, be, be able to provide and protect them. They're going to have to look at you and go, this man is so unique. He is so special that I'd rather be with him. 
than be with this guy over here by myself. And you're going to have to treat that woman really good because else or else she's going to bounce. So like, there's a lot of people always think it's just the man. I'm like, no, think about the man you have to be to be able to do it. You have to be a really special man in order for that woman to choose to be in that relationship with you. So this is high pergamous. They are high. Yes, they're high. Per- they want to date up. They want to date a man that more social status, better looking, you know, more money, whatever, better educated. Mm-hmm. So, and this is why men need to achieve, you know, we need, this should drive us to want to do better. And I believe, you know, that's the way God wired it because nothing motivates a man like a woman, you know, like that's going to drive us to, to succeed more than anything. Men, men have fought wars for women. So yeah, dude, I thought, I just thought that was a beautiful story, especially with the kids, you know, like, to this day, I mean, if I can read a passage here, if you, if you don't mind, if I can read it, this is out of the book uh, in the Apocrypha. We use the Apocrypha. It's called Sirach chapter 14. It says, be as the father unto the fatherless instead of a husband unto their mother. So thou shalt be as the son of the most high and he shall love thee more than thy mother doeth. So literally the act that I did of being a father first. So that, and that was a true, I didn't even know I was doing that. I read, oh, this is what I'm doing. I saw it after I took, covered her. I said, literally I was a father to the father. Cause that's how y'all described. He is a father to the fatherless. Yeah. So I was a father to the father. And then I became a husband eventually. And so, and, and, and my son, Deandre, Ayanna, they love me. They, they yeah. love me. They're, they're thankful because I rescued. It's like I became a redeemer. They've been great. Right. They have been grafted into my home. So you even understand what it means to redeem, what it means to be grafted in. Like you truly get an understanding when you get to walk out the word and mm-hmm. nothing. And, and you can't say, oh, this is done away with. I get to fully live out this word to my fullest. And it's exciting. That's good stuff, man. Let's talk about straightway a little bit. Yeah. So why do you think they get a bad rap? <laughs> because they tell the truth. Yeshua says that's going to happen in John 15. He says that he says that you will be hated by all men because of him. We, we are hated because of our commitment and our love to Yeshua. He chose us out of the world. And so the reason why straightway is hated is because they don't cater to men, to women. Pastor Dow preaches the word of Yah straight up. And he, like you, you said, you heard him talking about fat pat preachers or, I mean, pastor, he, he, he will call out if you're fat. He will call you out if you're a whoremonger, if you're drunk, if you're rebellious, if you're Jezebel. He, he, there's nothing that Pastor Dow will not touch. I mean, you just hope, oh, this is the week. And he will, that, it's not him, it's the word. That word cuts. He does not avoid the hard topic. There's nothing that, the only thing I, I fought Pastor with, and I'm not going to lie, this is the only thing that I fought Pastor on because I heard it so much in Christianity. Pastor does not talk about tithing. But mm-hmm. other than that, other than that, he talks about everything else. Now, he, he, he's talked about giving and tithing, but that's not. But in Christianity, you heard it all the time. That's the one thing they put from the Old Testament is tithe your money, because that's why I gave millions of dollars, because that was preached. But holiness is what's being preached at Straightway Truth Ministry. And Pastor Dow not only preaches the word, this is key. He lives the word. Pastor Dow don't live in some home isolated. Pastor Dow himself lives on community. He is the head of a community that we call it the hub, Straightway Truth Ministry. So it's just, that's why I think he's hated. He's hated because he tells the truth. How many people are part of Straightway, part of that community down in Texas? Uh, in, in Tennessee? Tennessee, I mean, sorry. Maybe close to 30, maybe. It's, 30. You know, it's, yeah, but then there's people surrounding that comes to the to the service and things of that nature but there's there's people that live on community and then we have people that's off landers off community and then uh you really see the 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 size of the true people who are committed to straightway those who come for the feast so we do keep the holy feast we keep uh we keep passover we keep uh, um unleavened bread we keep pentecost and we also keep the uh the feast of tabernacles but all of them too but we meet that three times a year at the hub so you see thousands of people coming from all over the world. When I say all over the world, I'm not, that's not, we got people from Canada, we got uh, from the UK, from all over the world, coming from all over the United States, coming over for the feast and everything. So can you be a white, can, the truth, huh? can you be a white boy and join the church? <laughs> we have elders. We have elders that are so-called white or Caucasians. So yeah, we, we, we call anybody, anybody that 
See, I tell you, I'm an Israelite in the flesh, but more importantly, I'm an Israelite in spirit. Yeah. So yes, we have people who you will call Caucasian or white. They are Israelites too, because they've been baptized in the name of Yeshua. They've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they are an Israelite because they have eyes to see and ears to hear. That's what makes you an Israelite. Now, these people that are living there, they, they have jobs outside of the community and they, and basically it, it really is like acts. If what you're it sounds like where everybody puts their money together and they give to each person as they have need. And that's kind of the way they're living. Yeah. So some people have jobs outside. Some people got jobs just on the community because, you know, depending on what your community is, I know at the hub, they have, they have uh, cows and they have, uh, they have livestock they got to take right. care of. There's things they got to be taken care of on the land. There's got to be. So it's it just depends on what the community is. Like here, our community, we have businesses. So we mm-hmm. got guys that go out and, and they build for a living. And then whatever they raise, they they donate that to the to the to the hub here, to the uh, community up here. So we have ways of we have self-supported ministry. We, we, we know we're not really big on. We don't get a lot of money necessarily coming in. It's more about us, what we can raise by just our own efforts. Gotcha. So sounds awesome. I mean, I remember when I first read that, and when I first became a Christian, and I I read how the first Christians lived. I was like, man, that must, what a great way to live. That must have been so rich, you know, like to live in real community like that. I'm sure there's challenges with it though, because I oh, there are I, challenges. <laughs> yeah, challenges. yeah, you got people, right? You, you know what the challenge is? You find out how selfish you are. Yeah, that's how far it's. I would liken living on I would liken living on community like polygyny. And this is what I mean. So, like right now, you probably live in your own house, you get to do what you want. But when you live on community, guess what? There's nothing that's called your own. You share everything in common, right? You gotta share the bathroom, you got whatever your situation is, right? And you start learning like what does it truly mean to love my brother? What does it really mean to love my brother? Well, you know, like we share the same car, whatever the case is. Well, guess what? In polygyny, it's the same thing, it's a community. Of women, they gotta share the same man, and you really learn how selfish you are. So women can be on community; they love community because they get to cook together, they get to share the cooking duties, their cleaning duties. But now, when you put a woman with another man, with two, where they gotta share it, that's when they start really living community. They really start learning how to love y'all and how to love their sister. Meaning, what what it really means to love your sister is you love yourself. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges with that, with polygyny? Because I'm th- something I'm thinking about doing myself. I mean, it, it depends if God leads me. Or... From the woman perspective. I mean, what, what you... Well, I guess from your perspective, what have you found? It's like some of the biggest challenges. Is it is it like dividing the time? It, you know, do you have a favorite? That was always the thing. Like I've always known, even before I discovered this information, I always knew deep down that I, I would be more polygyny would just feel more natural. I didn't even know the term polygyny. I thought it was polygamy. But I just always knew that if I wasn't a Christian, I would probably be into some kind of weird relationship structure is what I thought. But I would never have considered it because my heart was devoted to the Lord, which is why 18 of the last 23 years I've been single and sexless. It's not easy to do. Um, so, but I always thought, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, eh, I'm sure there's, you know, like it probably sounds good on paper, but it's probably really uh, a mess. Like you're going to have a favorite and it could be chaotic because the women and the jealousy and all the things I, I would imagine that because I was, I guess I was just trying to dismiss it from my mind as like, it really wouldn't be as good as it looks. Like, I think that's probably what men want to do because I think that a lot of men probably think about this. I think men crave variety, which is why there's, you know, the in- infidelity rates are so high. So in reality though, like, what are the biggest challenges with it? I would say the biggest challenge is that, I, first of all, I look at polygyny, you know, I, I was a business major. I, I, I studied it, uh, as a business uh, management was my my emphasis. And so I really kind of look at polygyny as just running a business. I'm the CEO. My women are like my uh, either my VPs or my managers and my children are like my employees. Right. And so I kind of look at it from that perspective or like a coach. I'm the head coach. And maybe your first two, three women, they are the coordinators. You may have an officer coordinator, defense coordinator, special team. Or then you may have position coaches. Other women coming in, they may be the position coaches. But then you have your players, which are your children. So I, I kind of look at it from that perspective. But right. I think the challenge that I have experienced so far up to this point is just really helping uh, my first one, just really trying to overcome all the lies that she's learned. She went to a Catholic school and just living up in America and just being selfish. But like I said, she's doing good. She's gotten better every every day. She's she's fighting it, learning. 
Um, but it's not like it's not like they have cat fights. It's not like they. It's just that I want her to. I just want her to be where I'm at, where I'm enjoying this. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's mm-hmm. not. So when I say the chance, not like they sit there and argue. They 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 work well together. They help each other. If they need to watch a baby, one time I think that when my um my concubine when she had the baby, uh, she was getting she had to get stitched up because it she tore a little bit mm-hmm. and the baby was crying and needed to be breastfed. Well, guess what? My first one breastfed her. Literally oh. breastfed because she had milk, so she breastfed her. So, so they worked there, and then she just had a baby, and she's in there helping her massage her back. She even told me, she says, "Master," they, they refer to me as master. Nothing wrong, but I like but, it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I know it's gonna yeah. women are women right. that are watching are gonna hate that. No, no. <laughs> but, but yeah, but she. But I was trying to massage her back because my she because she's a doula. I was trying to massage her back, and I was you know I'm just a man trying my best to figure this thing out. And then um, uh, my congress, she comes in there, Kyrisha, she comes in there and she massages. She's like, ah, oh. she said, hey, you're going to retire. I like what she does. So they're working with each other. They help. Yeah. Each- it's just such a beautiful thing Dude. to see them working together, loving one. And like when I see them loving each other and working and supporting, like right now she's in purification, meaning she doesn't really, you know, associate with everybody because she's in, she's unclean for 80 days because I had a daughter. Well, guess what? Who's taking care of the two that she had? Her, her sister wife, she's right, the one right. that's taking her, giving them a bath. I'm even helping out a little bit and and because they're short staff. And it's just the, the love that you see them operate is like, wow, this yeah. is so amazing. It's amazing. So, but that's the, I would say that's the only challenge is just that. But I from there, and then when it comes to time, you talked about time. Now, I'm going to be honest, in the beginning, because I was like, okay, how do you do this? Because when you first did it, you kind of sneak it off to the second one because you know that the first one is kind of, you know, sad, you know. So you're like, do you sneak? I'm like, why am I creeping? I'm not going to be creeping. This is, this is nothing wrong because you try to change it in your mind. So the transition was weird because now it's one thing to talk about it is a whole other thing to practice it, right? Yeah. And then I try to do this equal uh, the time. Okay, we're going to do this, you know. And I didn't feel like I had the pressure because she's a concubine. So I didn't feel like I had the pressure. I got to be equal. But mm-hmm. I already say, you know something? I'm not going to do this. E- I'm not going to do this equal stuff anymore. Because for me, I felt like I became a slave. Mm. And now it revolves around them. And now I'm just this guy that they just want to just do me all the day. You know what I'm saying? No. I said, I when Poor I. Poor guy. Yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm being sarcastic, brother. Yeah, yeah. From a man who hasn't had sex in like five years, I do not feel sorry for you. <laughs> so I just said, it's kind of like, you know, I have a lot of, you know, before uh, I, you know, I had my Joe moment, I call it my Joe moment. I did have seven children, right? I had, had uh, seven, six boys and one girl at the time, right? And I liken it like this. All of them are uniquely different, right? Even though they came from the same father, same mother, right? But I didn't spend equal time with each and every single one of my children. Some had more needs than others. Some wanted that attention. Some some didn't want the attention. They could be by themselves. And so it's, it's more about being equitable than being equal, if that makes any sense. And so sure. I believe polygyny is the same way. Like my 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 um my my second one, Kyrisha, she's a mature woman. She's 37 years old. You know, me just talking, I like talking to her. She she's a good conversation. She's a little bit closer to my age. And so I can talk to her about spiritual things and just 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 you know bounce things off of her. I can spend time with her and she just need a little here and there, you know. Now, my other one who's the first one, she's on the younger side, you know, she needs a little bit more attention because she's still working through this stuff. And so, mm-hmm. but just because I'm with her doesn't mean I'm, I'm doing anything. I could just yeah. be with her, you know. So sure, sure. really just you as a man, you need to be aware of your community, even as a community head. I got brothers who I talk to every day. There's some brothers I don't see all the time, mm-hmm. but I'm checking in on them. So it's just like being a gardener. You gotcha. know, you're going to plant every, oh, no, I got, if I get this water, I got to get this water. No, yeah, this, yeah. One this much water, this may need a little bit of this, this may need a little pruning. So it's kind of like being a gardener, pretty That's much. That's useful advice for me, seriously. I won't mention that we're going to have a polygyny debate on this channel, well, on my channel, on December 21st. It's a Thursday at 9 p.m. I have Pete Rambo, and I have one other guy that goes by Bible Marriages on Facebook, really smart guy. And I have two ordained ministers, two pastors that are going to be on the, the opposition side. One guy, Mike Holloway, Pastor Mike Holloway, you can look him up. He's an internet debater. He's got some videos on YouTube, a sharp guy. 
and they're going to discuss biblical polygyny. So I know there's going to be people in my comments that are going to be like, this is wrong. Like, uh, you know, I already saw one comment. Polygyny is a sin. And so I'm like, I'm not, we're not going to go too deep in, into that in this conversation because it would just take too long to explain it. But I invite you to tune into that because that'll be very much in depth in that area. But you mentioned like... Um, you should get Pastor Dow in there in that debate. Maybe you know what? Yeah, you maybe, 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 maybe we'll expand it to three. Too, so. Pastor Dow, if you're willing to come on, I'm extending the offer to you. We'll, we'll do six instead of four. I'll do, yeah. I'll do that because I would love to have you on there. Um, he, he's, he's been doing it. I mean, I, I know Pete Rambo. He's, uh, he just started, but Pastor's been doing this for – and he's, he, 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 he has a, a beautiful home. His home okay. is orderly. So it's one thing to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. But he has – he has like three or four now, and he's and he he's doing a great job in showing us how it's kind of like. Would you rather go to a pastor who who only has his one wife, and you have a second wife, and you're trying to get help and counsel? Right. Like, I'm glad I can say I have a pastor that if I'm having an issue with my two, I can go to one who has three or four. Right? Yeah. I can I can he will know how to navigate me through. Okay, this is what you need to do, or you need to spend whatever the case. Yeah, is. sure. But a, but a person a person that doesn't have that can't even really help you. Love it. So, so good, man. So yeah, I'll please pass it down. Yeah. Yeah. If you're watching this, I would love to have you December 21st at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you're free at that time, let's let's make it happen. Um, I mentioned you mentioned like the, how the one woman was taking care of the other's children. I was like, it's just a you know, people say that like this is a, can you imagine what it would be like? And I'm like, so this is the way it is now. You go to work, you're usually your wife goes to work, you ship your kids off to daycare. And then, or, or maybe the school, you're not raising them. They're being indoctrinated by who knows, right? Who knows what? And then we, that's actually, you're saying that's better. And they're like, you better make a lot of money if you do this. And I was like, why? I said, look, the gas and electric's paid. All the fixed expenses are paid. The mortgage, the house payment, what? Some extra food for a third person when that person could literally be the person staying at home taking care of the kids. I think that would probably be cheaper. It, it, I, I can tell you as a financial advisor, I'm, this is my personal opinion and my professional opinion, but let's just say personal because I don't want to make this a, I meant to get this cleared. But anyway, but for, I, when I was with my first wife, my legal wife, right? Do you know how many baby, you know, because I this was during that time I was playing, you know how many babysitters? I, I was spending ten to $12,000 a year on babysitting. Because you have games, you do this, you take your wife on a date night. That's a whole nother world. But you're doing all these things. And then and then you, you get a babysitter maybe the first three years, and then she has to go off to college. Then you have to find another babysitter that you trust. And then they go off. And I remember one time there was one girl that we got because we were running out of babysitters. We were having so many children. We got another one that was recommended to her. We didn't know who she was. Then she brings her boyfriend over. We were on our date night. Boom. We stopped the date night. We went and said, bro, no because right. people know your children walk in, seeing them doing stuff like, whoa, what is going on? Yeah. And now I got my woman. This, this is my woman, right? She's yeah. taking care of my sons, even though it comes from another woman, but they still come all from me. Yeah. She, and I don't have to worry about that stuff because yeah. she's in my house. I don't have to pay no babysitting fees. Yeah. I don't have to send them to school. We homeschool. That's another thing, too. You get to homeschool now. You have m many hands make the, the work light. So, right. I mean, just it's you save way more money than outsourcing it because, because if you're doing it just one man, one woman, you got to outsource everything. Uh, uh, cleaning, cleaning the house, right? Yeah. I, I live in a big house, right? But guess what? When you have women, they can clean it together now. Yeah. But before, when I was playing ball, I had to pay for a clean lady, right. I had to pay for a babysitting, I had to pay for private schooling. I, had to, I mean, money was just going, just going out. Yeah. Nation yeah. building. Yeah, but he, I can do this forever. I can, yeah. I can live like this forever. I, I spend less money now. More yeah. money stays in. I, I thought so. And I, that's a big part of what I wanted to do in this conversation was overcome some of the misconceptions around polygyny, but also give you a chance to share your story. Mm -hmm. One thing, a theory I've had too, is like, you know, I've been trying to, you know, I've been working through all this in my mind about, I wonder why God did this and how, what the, 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 the how it plays out practically or, or in the real world. And one of the things I thought is, because it is a man, somebody messaged on one of my posts recently. They said, if she lets you, I was talking about if, you know, if a woman was to let you, da, 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 you know, take a second wife or whatever. I said, if she lets me, I was like, if it's my biblical right, I don't, I'm not going to marry a woman that I have to ask permission to exercise my biblical right with. So where I'm going with that is like, I believe that just a man's vocalizing the fact that it's his biblical right to take a second wife, even if he never does. What that does is it does subjugate the woman to the man, 
mm-hmm. because all he has a right to, but she does not, and she knows it. And I believe because that that creates polarity because that pushes her to her feminine, him to his masculine, keeps the difference, which keeps the relationship spicy. They probably have a better sex life. You know, there's a lot of better things that come from that, whether he does it or not. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that he gets pushed into his masculine and her to her feminine, which is, you know, underneath his headship. And I believe that's what keeps it healthy. And maybe that, maybe then the divorce rate wouldn't be 56%. And maybe then of the people that stay married, that 44% of the people that stay married, they stop having sex after year four monogamy only, because I believe monogamy only creates equal equality almost where she can't, you know, she can't take a second. He can't take us, you know, like this till, till death do us part forsaking all the others thing, which did not come from the Bible creates more of an, an equality and then and then the women lose interest in the man eventually and stop, don't want to have sex with him anymore i'll so say that, that, I'll, I'll say this like you know before you know you know you probably saying that you know i play ball that had access but i i'm actually a boring monogamous i'm very <laughs> boring i'm very i'm very like very predictable you know what i'm gonna do if i'm not at work i'm at home i'm very you know systematic right you know i'm a planner by nature right I'm boring when it comes to monogamy. So yeah, you'll be happy like I got him, but then like, oh, he's boring, you know, because I don't really play the game. You know, they call it the yeah. game. Yeah, I sure. I don't know how to play the game. I wasn't a player, 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 not not player, player, player. You, you're wrong, <laughs> right? A player. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. <laughs> so I didn't really do that step, but but being a polygamist, being a polygynist, right? It naturally makes me be an alpha. And here's why. I still got work. I got two women I got to manage. I got a community. I got things that I got responsibility I got to do. And so because of that, no one woman has a monopoly on my time. Right. And yeah. so I'll even say this with my my first, uh, my new uh, sister, Brie, I would just say Brie, but my first, she, she was amazing. Compared to my first legal wife, she's blows her out of the water. I'm just, I mean, in, in servitude, in obedience, in love, just blew to me, I was like, wow. Like, you'll be like, you've had a woman, you'd be happy just to have sex after 18 years. Like, wow. <laughs> like, she just blows her out of the water. I'm thinking like, man, this is good. I'm thinking like, man, I think I'm getting the best that she has to offer. This is it. But guess what? As much, if I would have gotten a second one based off of her permission or waited for her, I would have never gotten a second woman. I'm just telling you that right now. But it wasn't based off of her. It was based off of what I was willing to do, what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I got her. Now, let me ask you this, Rob, just to see if you can figure this out. Do you think as great as my first one was in the truth, do you think that her performance got better when I took on the second one or you think it went down? Well, I already know the answer to this because you told me and it is what I suspected. I suspected that her performance got better because, you know, there's another per- it's competition anxiety or I don't know if we call it anxiety, but there there's some competition there. So you got to step it up a little bit. Right. Which is why I say. The reason that I've gotten such pushback from women, I believe, Christian women, on this, you know, talking about polygyny, is because they don't want to give up their right to get get fat after they get married, deny the man of sex, and then recommend divorce court, and you know, take half of a shit basically if they choose to. This, unfortunately, they they lose all that. Mm-hmm. They lose all. Let me. Do you play sports, Rob? I mean, you look like nah, you a little up. bit. I mean, I wasn't okay. very good. Not, okay. You know, Okay, well, I'll tell you this. I, I, I actually practiced, I actually was in a polygynous relationship all my life. You, you know how I was in a polygynous? I played football. You had one head coach, right? Mm-hmm. And I played a position called defensive end, right? And in that position, I would love to be the only guy. And there's no backup. You are the guy. You don't have to show up to practice. But on game day, you're the starter. I would love that. In my flesh, I would love that. Now, do you think I would be as good if I knew I had somebody on my back? trying to take that position, my game always got better because of the healthy the healthy competition. Yeah. And I believe that that's what my women are experiencing is that natural healthy competition. I mm-hmm. want the team to win. I just want to be the guy to get the sack. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so my women, look at they, 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 I want you to have babies. I just want the babies. I want the sack. I want to have the baby for you. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. You got to work through the envy and yeah. you, know, you should be happy for your sister when she has a baby and you should be happy and Support one another because when any one of you guys are having a baby, Team Kabir wins. That's what it's about. It's about Team Kabir. Just like when I got a sack or my teammate got a sack, Team Green Bay Packers win. That's 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 a victory. And so trying to help my women to think more like a team 
player instead of being selfish. There, there is no I in team, we say, right? So is there an I in polygyny? I don't know. But no, yeah. there's not. So, yeah. so, so, but really try to get them to have that mentality. But so I under so the beauty about me as a man, and I think any man, if they played any type of sports or any type of activity where they had to work together, that is the, the view I come in. So I can relate to what my woman is going through. I know what it's like to 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 be the starter. And then I know it's like to when they bring in somebody else as a backup. I understand mm. the pressure. So I'm not gonna sit here and say, well, why do you feel the way you feel? These are I had these feelings. How can I judge her and say it's wrong that she feels that way when I felt that way as a player? Mm-hmm. And so I had to work through it. And so guess what? Because I had to work through that stuff. When I when I towards the end of my career, I got demoted back to from a starter to a third down specialist. And so somebody else came in. And now I could I could sit here and pout on the bench and say, hmm. They're not playing me or forget them. Or I could say, hey, I'm going to be a good cheerleader for my teammate. I had to work through that. I'm going to tell him what he, hey, man, keep on doing. And guess what? When I did that, I became even a better player, a better friend, a better, you know what I'm saying? Sure. All this stuff. And so now I can help my woman to overcome whatever she's going through because I had gone through it too. Yeah. Just like Yeshua. What did Yeshua? He's not telling us to do something he didn't do. He literally came, lived here on the earth, lived a perfect life, was tempted in every single way. And he showed us that through him, we can also overcome sin. And so that's why I'm able to do that, because we have a Messiah who's done it. He mm-hmm. understands our, our ways. And so as a husband, I understand what my woman is going through and I can help her. She said, well, you can't relate. Oh, I can relate. I said, is this how you feel? How do I know? Because I play football and I had to work through that stuff. I grew up in a family with seven of us. I wasn't the only I wasn't the only child. I had to compete for my dad's attention, too. So I know what you're going through. And so it is and and even helping them in, in ways like this, because right now my uh, my woman, she has three now for me. She has a two boys and one girl. And I asked her, we just had a baby girl. I said, let me ask you. I said, do you love her more than you love these two? She says, no. Like she said, no. Like, like, what kind of question is that? Right. I said, really? Like, are you sure you don't love her? Well, you spending more time with this new baby. Well, she needs me. She needs milk. She's so vulnerable. But these are older. They can kind of do I said, but I mean, who do you love more? I said, well, guess what? You don't even question who do you love more. Why do you question me? Yeah. I'm, I'm in the same situation you're in when it comes to my women. Right. So you try to help women to try to understand that a man can love multiple women, uh, women, just like a mother can love multiple children that they uh, brought into the world. Yeah. I've used that analogy before. Like, so are you, so you're saying what a, a parent shouldn't have more than one child because <laughs> it, like that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think, it, I think there's a big difference in what women say they want and what they really want. Yeah. You know, like, because they say they want, I just want you. I want to be with you and know. But the thing is, is if you look at what the the numbers are right now, and people push back against this, but their majority of the women are sleeping with a minority of the men, right? They're like, they want, because they're hypergamous. And because women are doing better, they're making more money than they've ever made. They're getting, you know, educated more than they've ever have. It shrinks the amount of dating, the dating pool for them, because there's only so many men above them. Mm -hmm. So 80% of the women they say are sleeping with 20% of the men. Some people say, some people say it's 95, five. I don't know if that's true or not, but a majority. So they're already in polygamous relationships. They it's serial. It's called serial polygamy. polygamy. Even though they say they want monogamy, they're choosing to be with men that mm-hmm. they know they're probably not their only one. Cause the man hasn't wiped them, you know, yeah. hasn't committed to them, but they're choosing that. So like, even though your wife says, I don't you know, she's pouting or whatever. She's still there. She hasn't left. Right. I'm, I'm bet you guys probably have a pretty, better. I'm guessing you have a pretty good sex life, you know, like things are because that's it's the way God. I'm not saying it's for everybody because I think monogamy is wonderful. I think monogamy only is unbiblical, and I believe that causes a lot of problems. Just the fact that it's a possibility, it's a man's right to do it, changes the dynamics of the relationship because a woman she might not want you to take a second and she's going to go and she's going to show up, she's not going to deny you sex. She's going to make sure to house whatever, whatever the things is that you were, that you married her for. She's going to probably come through on those things. So you don't go out and find another woman, you know, like maybe, I don't know, but I could see how that would be the case. And I don't know. I always tell people, I said, you know, I say, I heard the saying, so I don't want to act like I invented this word, but somebody said, don't give a woman what they want, give them what they need. Yeah. See, if I gave my woman what I, what she wanted, I, she would be the only one. 
but I gave her what she needed. And because I got me another woman, she's now a better woman, a better sister, a better mother because of her sister. So you see the dynamic now because she has a love for Yeshua, uh, the Messiah, because of her love and she understands my divine right. She's here. And because she's staying with it, she's being sanctified. Her's Mm -hmm. not leaving and her staying with it. She's being sanctified through this process and now becoming a better woman than if she leaves. Yep. Does, that, does that make sense? And yep. so women need this. Now, I'm not, like I said, I'm not, polygyny's not for everyone. Monogamy's not for everybody, right? There's some people that were created just to be, now it yep. seems like that's not your problem. No. You know, saying, no, I don't I, I'm done. I'm retired. I want to get back in the game. So. <laughs> yeah, now. yeah, yeah. But you got to be able to provide these women. You can't just, it's not about just having a side chick and banging them. I take care of these women. All these women do not have to worry about uh, they're being provided for. Yeah. So that's what you get. You give them safety, provision, security. All of that comes from me. I'm responsible for them. They, they yeah. belong to me. Provision and protection. I got. I believe the polygyny or or the the possibility. It's God's social welfare system. Yes. Matter of fact, I was telling somebody. I said the way. Yeah. If you look at the way the uh, the Bible, but if you look at the way Yah designed it, women. Because I have a daughter, right? My daughter was designed in such a way, the way the way the not her design, but the way the 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 family structure is set up, a girl, a woman is supposed to be 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 taken care of from cradle to grave. And let me show you how that works in in in, in the Hebrew culture. In the Hebrew culture, right now, I'm her provider for my daughter, right? Mm-hmm. One day she's gonna get of age, and I'm going to, as her father, give her to her husband. Right. And it may be an older man who has other women already, but he's going to now he's going to make we're going to make a, a covenant like, hey, I'll take care of her. And now he's going to take care of her. And he may die because he's an older man. He's going to die off. But her whole desire is to, to say, I want to I want to carry a seed for this man. And I hope it's a son. And here's why you want a son, because now when she gets when he's dead, that son now will be the one to take care of his mother. Mm. That's her inheritance because inheritance wasn't passed from husband to wife. It was passed from from father to son. Wow. I didn't know if that. You, if you remember Yeshua, remember when Yeshua was the old, I believe Yeshua was born. And this is my belief, my personal belief, my opinion right now, based off of what I've read. I believe he grew up in a political home. Yeah. Because he was the eldest son of Mary. But we know that he had other brothers and sisters. It was mentioned in the in the gospel. He had other brothers. But when he was on the tree, what did he what did he say to John? He said, John, this is your mother. Uh, John, this is your the woman. This is your son, because he was basically handing on and say, hey, I'm now leaving. It's now your responsibility to take care of my mom. So why do you think why do you think he was in a polygynous? Because I've heard, I heard that, that somebody said that Joseph wasn't, you know, Mary wasn't Joseph's only wife, more than likely. Where did you get that from? Because I know you had James as a brother. Was James older or younger? I mean, if James was older, it'd be clear because well, Mary was a virgin. One, you don't hear about John. You don't hear about uh, Joseph that much, right? So he had right. to be an older man. Yeah. And we know that he had other siblings. So it didn't, we don't, if if, if, if Mary had all those children, we would have heard that. So right. it sounded like she probably only just had Jesus. I mean, that we know that. that just, right. You just, I'll say this, when you live this culture, like every time when a, 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 an American Christian read the Bible, you have to understand they're reading from the frame mind of their culture. Sure. They have, they, they, polygyny is not even an option. Everything they read, they can read, they can, somehow they just read it monogamy. But yeah. I'm a person who's born in it. I'm a person who's living it. So when I read it, I can say, oh, okay, because that's how we talk. Like, okay, right. that's, that's, that's my son, Yeshua. That's yeah. Yeshua. Don't he have other brothers and sisters? I have, I have uh, three sets. I have eight with my first one. I have three with my second one, and I have one with the. Guess what? And they are all siblings. See, in in your culture, in, in the American culture, what they call them? Oh, they're half. No, if you come from the father, they are full blooded brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Who name are they carrying? They're carrying mm-hmm. the father's name. Now, I do have two that came from my 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 second woman right now. I got two. And they've been grafted into my home, but they're not my seed. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, th- so my other sons that I have from other women, they would not be related. But the sister that I have with their mom, they would be half. Right. You, you, that, that you can more say that's more of a half situation because they both share the same mother, but not the same father. 
Right. Does that make sense? So yeah. wherever, wherever it comes from the father, and, and, and how do you know this is true? Look at the 12th tribe of Israel. That that came from one man, four, four different four women. women. And, and God orchestrated that. He orchestrated. So he says, oh, that's my half brother. No, they, they are all sons of what? Sons of Jacob. Yep. Sons of Kabir, you know, and things of that nature. So hit a, I hit, yeah. hit a Christian with that because J God orchestrated Jacob to have four wives by opening and closing wombs. How do you explain it? Like, I mean, you're saying that what the, the most of them were bastards when Even Deuteronomy God. says that ba bastards can't go into the, the house of the Lord. I can't yeah. worship like you're trying to say the most of the house of Israel are bastards. Like it doesn't even make sense. He blessed Leah, I believe, for giving his because Leah gave his her her uh, her uh, her uh, servant to her husband. Right. Guess what he said? Because he did that, he gave her another son. Right. You know, so. Blessed her because she's because she sinned. That's what people will say. That doesn't make sense. Um, you mentioned about a woman being taken care of her whole life. I really thought that that was profound because I think about like the Bible is pretty clear about that, where a man is supposed to pay the bride price to the father. You know, he takes the, the woman shouldn't even move out of her, her parents' house till she gets married. And then the, the man's responsible for, it. and the Bible says, don't put away your first wife. It talks about if a man sleeps with a virgin, you know, seduce a virgin, he has to marry her. What happens in monogamy only is he sleeps with a virgin or a younger girl. And then he leaves the wife and runs off with the younger girl, leaves the kids follow. Like this is against everything the Bible said to do. no, you got to stay with the first wife and continue to treat her just as equal as the, as the second. You, gotta, you can't hate her. You have to continue having sex with her, provide for her. You can't diminish her, her, uh, you know, food and whatever it said. Uh, I forget what the other word was. I was even accused. I was even personally accused of in, from a Christian perspective that when my wife left, the doctrine is I can't ever remarry because divorce is not, you know, divorce is not an option. And if I get with another woman, I'm committing adultery. Now, no, one, this is this is the the thing. Yeah. So, I'm like, okay, I have a I have a a a a, a call or what do you call? It? I have a um an edict to be fruitful and multiply, but the one I want to be fruitful and multiply is taken off. Right? Am I now no? I mean, and, and and completely spoil the seed. What am I supposed to do? It's in my. I'm trying to leave an inheritance. My inheritance has got taken out. So now it's natural for me to now want to get another woman to be able to produce seeds, sure. a righteous seed, you know, not just to have, you know, unrighteous seed, but to have a, a righteous seed. And so, and that's the beauty about being a man that I have the ability that if one, if I do lose this batch, then I can find new ground to plant my seed. Think of it like agricultural. If you, if you do gardening, we do gardens. We, we actually plant gardens. Yeah. The Bible tells us. But if you think of agriculture, you don't just plant one seed in one ground. You go to different grounds. And yeah. some ground may be full of uh, thorns. Another one may be shallow. And, and, and some of these women are shallow. Right. Some of these women are among thorns. They, the cares of the world have taken away. Mm -hmm. And then you find that one good ground. And so even Yeshua is given a polygynist through agriculture. Who's the man? The son of man is the man that's spreading his seed. Right. right, and it's falling on all these different types of ground, and then it goes onto this one ground and produces a, it produces 60, 30, you know, it just multiplies. And well, everything. Just to make sure we're clear, though, you're not saying go out and spread your seed amongst women that aren't your, that you're not going to marry. Like, then, number yeah. one, you should marry them first, but he, and, and you know, and I think some people had said, uh, a friend of mine recently, or a guy I've gotten known recently said that understanding the definition of adultery from the Bible is kind of the Rosetta stone that unlocks a lot of this stuff. Meaning like when you realize that adultery isn't just stepping out on your spouse, it's no, it's a married woman, she, you know, stepping out on her husband, a man stepping out on his, his wife is fornication. And now he has, if he does that, he has to marry who actually, he has to marry her to avoid fornication. Um, but where was I going with that? When you say Mary, when you use the word Mary, are you talking? What, what are you, because, because like when I got with my second one, I, I, we didn't have a marriage ceremony. You know what our marriage was? I consummated with her. So, yeah, that, okay. So I, I guess, yeah, that's a great, great point. Cause I, you know, I've thought about that because that's the thing, big thing people push back on. And I thought I'm just going to do some kind of covenant ceremony, commitment ceremony. I'll have a pastor marry me in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of the government, but I'll know that I'm making a promise with God to take care of this woman until, or, you know, we're going to be together till that threw us part. Uh, and if I take a second wife, she cannot divorce me. Um, and that's my right to do it, whether I do it or not. Um, 
that, but that's what I thought, you know, like I wasn't just going to have sex with her and, but I'm going to make some kind of commitment to her covenant with her, maybe even a contract to provide, you know, cause I don't want her to feel like she's not protected. If down the road, I decide, you know, like she could just be think that maybe I'm just doing it for yeah, my own benefit. I have a, I have a covenant with both of my women and, mm -hmm. and in our culture, in our, in our biblical, because we live a biblical, biblical lifestyle, women can't divorce a man. Only a man can divorce a woman. So what I mean by that is, so let's say I do want to divorce a woman. I'll have to write her a bill of divorce. I'll need to put it in her hands and then send her out of my house. That is biblical divorce based off of Leviticus 24, I believe. And so that's how you do truly divorce. So she Now she can leave, but if she leaves, she has to remain unmarried because if she now goes and be with another man, so I left my man. Like you tell me your story that we were talking about before the show. If she would have left, you better make sure like, uh, can I see that bill of divorce? There better be a bill of divorce from that man releasing her. It'd be like, it'd be like the Packers. It'd be like the Packers taking a player from Chicago Bears without them being released by the. Because uh, you commit adultery, if not. They'll be committing uh, NFL. I would be, be committing adultery. Yes. Yes. Now listen. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to go too far down that one. because Yeah. 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 But, but, but I'm just telling you, but that's. That's how we practice it. So I would. So both of my women, the last people they were with, all passed away. So there's no. There, there was. I didn't need a, a bill of divorce or anything. Like I said, there was widow, and, and unfortunately, the one that my uh, my woman was with passed away. But if I did have a woman that was with somebody, she would have to. I would need to see a bill of divorce from that man. It'd be like release. She's a property. I know people hate this, but she is the property of that man, and I need to know that she's been released because I need to know I'm not trespassing against my neighbor. Because so if, I, if I don't, if I do that, then I'm committing adultery. What if a woman was married to another man in the eyes of the government, you know, just a traditional way, whatever, and then they got divorced for 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 maybe it wasn't infidelity. I know because I think that that matters too. They got divorced. Is are you allowed to remarry her in the eyes of God? Well, that's a whole discussion. But I'll say this, okay? Just I'm just doing a, a broad brush, okay? If the man filed for divorce, then she's released, you know, because okay. he's the one that petitioned the court gotcha. for divorce, right? But you have to understand there's the legal and then there's the real people. Yeah. So all that's happened is the legal is like to me, and I'm just being honest, you know, and I don't have any bitterness towards my ex wife. She did what she did. Like to me, she's still my wife in my mind. She's still mine. Why? Because we did have a covenant. And you didn't file. And I didn't file. We, we, she's my, she is my woman still, right? Sure, sure. Because I have never given her a bill of divorce according to the Bible. And that's what we agreed upon. But we did legalize our marriage, right? So mm -hmm. we took something that was done in the bedroom and then we legalized it, Got the right? And so then we just took our social security number and merged that together, right? So all that really got broken in the divorce court was the legal marriage, but there's still a covenant in place. Now, unfortunately, she did go on and got remarried legally to another man. So she's committing adultery. Right. And the man is with her is committing adultery because I have never released her to properly because she took off. She, mm -hmm. I, I never, and once she took off, it's never been the same. So I've never been able to properly release her. And even in, if you look at First Corinthians 7, it says, if a woman do leave, it says literally, this is from God, not me. Paul said, not me. Don't leave your husband. But if you leave, remain what? Unmarried or be reconciled. Right. And husband, don't put her away. See, I never put yep. her away. And uh, dude, that makes so much sense because I've wondered about that. Because and also talks about if you marry the the whatever woman, you're you commit adultery yourself. Yeah, Romans chapter seven is that that thing. If I can just, if you don't mind me, just no, hold up. I'm, I'm, while you look it up, I'm going to shout out some of the locations of people that comment, and then maybe we'll take a couple questions. It looks like we got somebody from Norway here, Kentucky. Uh, let's see, Texas, Michigan, Mississippi, Wisconsin. Of course, Wisconsin's in the house. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you for those comments, guys. Feel free to drop a, a question or two. If you haven't posted your location, drop it now. Give you a shout out. But yeah, read us that verse. So Romans chapter 7, verse 2 says, For the woman which has a husband is bound by law to her husband. This is New Testament. So long as he, li he, he liveth. I'm still alive. But if the husband be dead, 
she is loose from the law of her husband, mm. not the state. We don't care about the state, her husband. So then if while her husband lived, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And if you go all the way down to, um, like if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Verse 10, it talks, and this is what I was reading. I'll just read this again. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but Yah, the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not her husband put her away. Meaning don't just kick a woman out. If you're going to kick her out and you don't want to be with her, give her the proper bill of divorce so she, so she can have, so she can be covered so, right you know, that's not right that's because then no one I was like I, I want to cover you but I can't cover you because if I cover you I'm going to be committing adultery right gotcha. and then the last one is uh first Corinthians chapter 7 verse 39 says the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband live not the state court license <laughs> no, this is based off the husband's life but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in, in the Lord. That's crazy because, you know, the Bible says, I want to say the Bible says adulterers don't inherit the kingdom. Right. Yeah. So like yeah. you're rolling, you're rolling the dice here saying that, you know, you're hoping that God's going to be gracious, which he might. I don't know. But somebody said uh, in the comments here, add Pastor Dow. Is, is Pastor Dow watching right now? Because I wonder if we can bring him in. I might be I might be able to email him really quickly. The, the, uh, the link. Yeah, you can. I can send you the. Uh, is uh, two different people said it. Yeah, if, if Pastor Dow, if you're here, let me know. I'll drop a comment, say hello, and I'll send you the uh, the link where you could come in and join us. Everybody would like to meet you. Yeah, we'll Pastor Dow's much wiser on this topic than I am. I'm just, but but I but I will say that. Uh, so th th that's the mistake that I think a lot of people make is they think that they're free because of the legal system. The legal is one thing. But there is a covenant and, and just laying with the woman and making that promise. So if she goes off, like even back in the days when people used to cheat, I remember in the locker room, oh, I got with your girl. But bro, when you say I got with your girl, you just literally acknowledge you committed adultery. Yeah. You, you, you acknowledge that's his girl and you slept with his girl. And we, but that was part of our world. It wasn't, it was okay to sleep with another man girl because they weren't married. You know, I'm well, talking what about, does the guy do? Then he bust like. Oh yeah, they'll be you know whatever. I'm just telling you, this yeah, is yeah, the yeah. guy. Yeah. Well, they'll even joke around about. It. That's not right. something you joke around about. Like I would never joke around. I slept with your wife. That's not something that I want. I wouldn't even want to admit that because that's an adult. That's a that's a, a crime that is punishable to death. You yeah, sleep with another man's woman. So it's just I love I love uh, straightway. I love our culture. I love the Hebrew culture. Um, so I'm not just an observant. I live this. This is my life. Yeah. And I see that it's way I've done Christianity. Most people, I understand a lot of Christians, but Christians don't understand me. And the reason why they don't understand me is because I've done what they've done, but they haven't done what I've done. Yes. I'm living. When I read that book, it'll be like if you read the uh, a book on the NFL, right? You will read it and I can read the same book and you and I will get two different perspectives of reading that book. Why? Because you never played in the NFL. When I read it, I understand some things that they're leaving out because I know the culture. And it's the same thing when you live in this biblical lifestyle. A lot of Christians just don't know because they're looking at this from a Roman Catholic perspective. That's how they're looking from a Roman Greco perspective and not from a biblical perspective. Yeah. Now, you know, everything's starts out. That's without getting in or? I, I don't see him, anybody commenting. I, if he has, uh, somebody said Shalom family a second ago. I was thought maybe it was him, but it doesn't say it was. It, Pastor Dow, if you are here, drop a comment. Let me know that you're here. Um, if you could, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link to join us for a minute before we jump off. Somebody had a question here. It says, uh, biblically speaking, what is the rightful role of the world's legal system when it comes to marriage? What's the what? The rightful role of the world's legal system when it comes to marriage. There's none, right? None. There's none. Show me in the Bible. The, the Bible is our, that's, that's what governs our marriage. Got it. So, so okay, Pastor, somebody, right here. Shalom. Tristan. I'm here. This is Pastor Dow. Now, I don't know. I'm seeing something from my end. Oh, he could be on my channel. No, Pastor. I see. Okay, he might be, but oh, let me, let me figure out. Let me figure out how to. Okay, I got it. Pastor Dow, I'm going to send you a link right now. 
I think about the debate online, I usually like debate in professional environment with a moderator face to face in person. Okay. That's the thing. He likes a uh, thing. He says, I, however, I will make a concession on this one. So he said he'd be willing to do the debate. Okay. Awesome. Pastor, concession. Pastor Dow, I'm going to go ahead and drop it here in the uh, comments. I don't know how else to do it. This is only for Pastor Dow. Um, <clears throat> you have a whole bunch of people. Oh, oh wait a second. Hold on. I, if you uh, text it to me, I can text it to Pastor. Okay. All right. Hold on. Let me figure out how to do that. I will. Hold on a second. Let me just. Uh, I'll do you it know how you, you, if, you, if you send it to me on Instagram, I can send it to Pastor. Okay. Hold on one second. I'll do that right now. I just got to get it to my phone. Okay. Perfect. You send it to my uh, I, Instagram? I'm I'm gonna send it right now. Let me just I just gotta get it to my phone from my computer to my phone. I d- I just sent it to myself on Messenger. Here it is. Yeah. Okay. This is where I learned everything from. So this is cool that he can everything becomes so clear, you know, like when you can break it down and explain all these things that I'd never really understood about, you know, marriage, divorce, adultery. Like there's a lot of things that it seems so unclear. Mm-hmm. But they really don't have to be. Exactly. Okay. okay. You just you just sent it, you just texted to me, right? Okay. Yes, that, that's it right there. Hey, Pastor, I'm texting it to you. I'm gonna send it to I'm gonna send it to his thing. I can even I'll even email it too. Because he could be on his computer. Don't forget to drop a question for KGB or for Pastor Dow. Probably stay on for at least a few more minutes. Pastor, I emailed it to you and, and and texted it to you. So you should be seeing Pastor Dow somewhere. Okay, awesome. Is there a link? Yeah, Pastor, I, I emailed it to you and I texted it to you. So however you get it. But yeah, there's any questions you said? Let's see. When Pastor Dow talks about Christianity, and, Chris, and let me re- put this up on the screen. It says... When Pastor Dow talks about Christianity and Christians, does the accuser of the brothers take a break? What does that mean? I think I, I think I was a shot. I think, I think people don't like when we talk about Christianity because we know living this life. So you have to understand, we don't just, we're not Christians. Because if you look up Christianity in the Bible, you know, Christianity is mentioned three times in the Bible. Three times, I think uh, twice singular and once plural. But it's really the follow of Yeshua. So, yeah. so and, and this and if that's even a word, let's just let's just go with let's say that, that they said Christianity because Paul knows nothing about the word Christianity, but let's just go with that. Then that means it was you it was always the way that uh it'll be like, and I and please forgive me if I'm gonna use this, it'd be like what white people used to call black people nigger, right? They use the mm-hmm. n-word, right? We wouldn't refer to oh I'm a you know, we wouldn't go around saying, hey, I'm a n-word, right? No, we wouldn't use those words, right? And so but when you look at how we refer to ourselves, hey, Pastor Shalom. But how we refer, to ourselves, we refer to ourselves as Hebrews. But yeah, there goes the great Pastor Dow. What's up, Pastor? Looking Jack, bro. Oh, oh, oh mercy. Have mercy on me. <laughs> Have mercy. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Enjoying the discussion that y'all are having there. Um, I'm on the phone because the uh, Elder Kabir sent me a, a link, but it was just a picture. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Oh, okay. okay. How can I help y'all? Now, we were just talking a lot about you and, and the difference that you made in KGB's life and just how you're able to break down biblical truths. And and I was like, well, if he's on here, or some actually, we had a couple requests to bring you on. Two people said, I had Pastor Dow. No. So I was like, well, let's see if he's here. And maybe we, maybe uh, if anybody's got any questions for Pastor Dow, that anything that we talked about or anything that you'd like to ask him about. Let me ask, I got a question for you, actually, that I'd like to to hit you with i i have it here i was going to ask kgb but i'm going to ask you instead is there anything with straightway church that you wish the public understood better or any misconceptions that you'd like to address well i mean i think the the best way to approach this rob is i wish that everybody would actually pick up the scriptures pick up the bible and read it for what it says if they do that they'll be extremely clear about straightway uh, the problem that we have today in this world is that we're used to going to the institutional churches, sit down and listen to a sermon where somebody tells us they may read one or two scriptures and then they tell you a bunch of stories. Um, here, we're literally students of the word. And so if people would actually just pick up their Bible and read it for themselves, they would be extremely shocked what's in that book. And it's so 
off the beaten path what we're doing today because there's very few people that's actually trying to be obedient to the word. And when they see, see this, it, it, um, it, it hits them really hard because they say, there's no way. Uh, the first thing they come up with, well, they're a cult. Well, whatever. I mean, you know, y'all feel he got accused of a lot of things. All of the apostles got put to death for following the way. We get it. We get it. But if people would just read their Bible, see what we're doing, read the scriptures, and then they'll find out that we're on the right side of history and not the wrong side. Yeah, I say that all the time when people debate me in, in uh, the comments. Ever since I started talking about polygyny, I was like, for out, throughout history, the religious people always persecuted God's messengers. I mean, the prophets, the, the disciples, Jesus himself, they were always persecuted by the religious people because they were saying things the religious people didn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Right. It's always what it was. So I'm like, this is no different. You think you think you're smarter than the Pharisees who were wrong and they studied the Bible their whole. Well, they they, they memorized it, but they didn't even recognize Jesus right in front of them. So you I, I just think to me, it's very prideful to think that you people, they get so locked into this Western Christianity mindset. When you say something that doesn't agree with it, they just slam you and think that they're so right. But they're really just like everybody before them. So. That's correct. It's very good. That's a very correct. Somebody said, uh, Christians, let's see. Let's see if there's a question here. How do, let me put it up on the screen, actually. How does biblical marriage culture, including polygyny, affect the development of sons and daughters, respectively? That's actually a great question because I've heard a lot of people say, well, how are the kids going to be affected? And I was like, well, one in three kids right now are being raised in fatherless homes, so it's got to be better than them not having a father at all. But I will say, and this is, goes to kind of what you something you said, KGB, earlier, where you were basically being a father to these kids before you ever even married the, the, the mom. And their studies show that it's not even necessarily just a father. Some, they said kids, just by having fathers in a certain neighborhood, the amount of fathers will dramatically decrease the negative effects of kids without like so like you were being a father you know to mul to multiple women's kids uh before even marrying or, or you know the second and i think that there's something to that right so that kind of shows you that you could be like the kids are going to have the same results whether it's monogamous marriage or polygynous marriage is what I'm, i guess yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously i have i have children from three different women and um obviously the ones that i lost they, they're not getting the benefit of having a father but the ones i do have they, they they can't tell the difference. You got my one with one woman saying to the other woman, Mama K or Mama Bree. I mean, they're all moms to them. They, 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 they can't tell the difference between like, oh, that's mom. I mean, they know that's their mom, but then they also know that's their mom too because they're all my family. We When we have a family Bible study or, or a family meeting, because I mean, I meet with the community, but I meet with my family. Guess who's there? My women and my children. And we, we read the word together. We do things as a family, you know, so... Uh, I, I think the development is going to even be better than what it was my first time around. I think mm. they have a way better. My 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 son that came from Kyrisha, uh, DeAndre, he treats his uh, my my sons from my other women like he's his own brother. He's right. his big brother to them. So mm. it, it's no different to me. I think it's good. What do you say, Pastor? Well, society definitely is no champion of righteousness, especially when we look at the dysfunctional homes and the society is just itself is coming unglued and coming unhinged. Um, we see that the feminist movement today has definitely been instrumental in removing the headship of the authority of the man out of the home. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know just as well as I do, it takes a man to raise a man. A woman cannot raise a man. And so when you look at society and then you turn around and you look at exactly what we're doing in restoring the biblical culture of the real true family unit, uh, you're, you're watching the family being restored the same way that the patriarchs did. I mean, if people would read their Bibles, and I'm going to say a statement here again, the majority of the Bible, and especially in the so-called, quote-unquote, Old Testament scriptures, all written by polygynists. Some of the greatest icons that it was in the book, such as Abraham, uh, Jacob, Moses, Solomon. Elplina, um, Gideon, Gideon, Solomon. Gideon, Solomon, you can go on. The majority of those scriptures are all written by polygynous people. And so if they believe that the Most High Yah has a problem with it, they're sadly mistaken. So the problem is, is that when you have Western monogamous society is trying to bring forced monogamy upon the people, which I actually believe is totally 1% against what the scripture says, we're looking at what happens and we're looking at what is in front of us when you look at a society that is given forced monogamy. And since it's forced, 
you're watching the destruction of it. And you all can tell, we all can tell that um, the end of the Western uh, domination in this world is quickly getting ready to come to an end. Um, and so, of course, also, uh, you have all these different alternative lifestyles and different ways. And you're watching the feminization of men today, where men are... Um, are being reared and raised by drag queens and reared and raised by women. And, and now these women who are out of touch and out of tune with y'all, uh, they're, they're trying to uh, make all the men just as infeminate or more feminine than they are. But when you have a home where there's a patriarch in it, where there's a man in it, where the patriarch was ruling, he is going to rear and raise those sons after the laws and statutes and commandments of the Most High Yah, and it will continue to keep our community growing and in the face of this wicked world right here, at least we would have some type of beacon of light. So good, Pastor. Uh, people, you know, get on me and they're like, "Did you see the Sister Wives show?" And I was like, "I didn't really watch that show, but I will. I do know that that guy had three consecutive marriages for seventeen years. Now I heard it blew up on the fourth marriage, but I thought I look at the average." length of a monogamous marriage in this country is eight years. The divorce rate's 56%. People like to brag like monogamy's killing it. They think they're doing so good. I'm like, have you seen the mess that we're living in? The rampant fornication, the record marriage, the the, 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 the rate of marriage has never been lower than it is right now. Five out of every thousand people per year are getting married. That's the lowest it's ever been because some something deep down, even if they can't articulate it, men know that this monogamy only thing isn't right something's wrong here and they just don't do it they just fornicate instead because you know and then the women they're forced to fornicate because what are they going to do sit around and be old old maids no i would i know if if i would have known this truth i would have got married right after i met jesus within a, probably a year or two at the most because i would have been like if i want to take a second later i can and that would have made my life so much different. Like I could have had kids in junior high by now. And instead I've suffered through all this freaking loneliness and, you know, struggling with like burning with lust at times. And I'm, what I tell people is most men won't do what I did. The only reason I really did it was because I got such a radical call in my life that I was like almost scared to screw up. Most men will just go out and sin because they're like, you know, what are they going to do? Well, Rob, so, yeah. you know, I, I, I like to bring up this particular point right here. Um, of course, when people look at straightway and, and they don't have any idea that we're restoring the biblical culture just by living the lifestyle, they don't understand that um, if a man goes and asks a woman, would you like to be a part of my home? Would you marry me? That woman is saying, yes, she's making an agreement to it. She's saying it. And in many, in some cases, they'll actually approach a good man and ask them, will you cover me? Right. And, and most people don't understand this because he now no longer does a woman have to settle for a mediocre man. She doesn't have to settle for a man that's just not cutting the mustard, if I can use those terms and be pure. She can look out and see a responsible man that, and she can look and tell that, that this man is, and his house is being a benefit to the community and stuff. And she can actually make herself known to this man and say, hey, can I actually... Um, uh, be a part of this house. Can I, would you please marry me? Would you consider marrying me? And then of course, now it's up to that man if he would bring her into the house. Um, and so a lot of times men get a stigma as if we're the ones that's trying to quote unquote force women. We can't force nobody. Y'all deals with free will, free will and everything. But in, in, in this society, in this culture today, women are just not settling for anything if they're holy and righteous and they live set apart. They're looking out and seeing, you know what, I would love to be a part of that family because it's righteous and it would benefit me as well. But more than anything, I could be a good ish or good wife to that man right there. And I want to help that man build. And that's yeah. what this is all about. Yeah, you're right. Like we, we were just talking about this before as, as women are already doing this, they're already in polygamous relationships because the majority, 80 percent of the women are sleeping with 20 percent of the men. Is everywhere I've read it because they're hypergamous. They want a man that's that's a little bit above them, and because now you know they're they're better educated, and making more money, it really has shrunk the dating pool for them. And what are the chances that one of these top tier men, these these you know alphas, if you want to call them that, what are the chances that they're going to marry one when they have unprecedented sexual access to all these women? They're not very good, right? Because you're telling them that it's, you get one ticket, you only get one. You got to give it, you give it to one person. They're like, screw that. I can go out and have sex with six or seven of them at the same time if I want to right now. They're not going to do it. So something yeah, really needs to change. And if I can say even that too, if you really think about just 
and I'm just looking about just our, our, our people in our, our, our culture, you know, men, especially with this feminization, the LGBT community, you're losing men either being incarcerated in jail, they're either becoming homosexuals or dying, you know? So, and that means there's more, there's more women than there are to men. So what, yep. what, are, what are these women to do? You can't, you can't get with some, most of them because they're incarcerated. A lot of them now turn into this other lifestyle where they only being with man with man. So yep. you got these women, they got to do, do they go gay too? Or do they, you know, right. the guy that can afford and has the ability to take them on and add them to their family and build. Yeah. Hey, I just recently married. Um, I've been married, recently married to this young damsel, a young woman for about, I don't know, maybe a month now. Um, one of the best choices, best decisions I've ever made in my life. And she just happened to be one that actually made herself known to me, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I said yes, because I had an interest, no doubt about it. But I'm talking about someone that is just spiritually beautiful, naturally beautiful. And I mean, in every single way, a Proverbs 31 woman, every single way in every facet. And she in herself is going to be such an example to all the younger women that's coming with her and behind her, that she would inspire uh, of the women in, in Israel to really truly want to be a Proverbs 31 woman, be a righteous woman to a righteous man. And you know, man, what type of seed would we be able to produce? Because right now we're outnumbered by the seed of the wicked. Mm -hmm. The seed of wicked is multiplying past the righteous ep exponentially more than we can ever even keep up. But that's the reason why we live set apart. We live set apart so we can follow the law, statutes, and commandments. The rules and guidelines of the Most High God do exactly what he says and raise a righteous nation. That's what this really truly is all about. And the women, they can really truly be the first line teachers at home, chase keepers at home to their children, to the family, inside of that man's house. And we can watch Israel grow and flourish and go well beyond all the sin and the debauchery and the lewdness and everything else we see that society throw at us. I'm glad that we live out here set apart, that there will be no drag queens and no public school, that my children be going to trying to teach them uh, an alternative way to be right. able to view and look at, at life as if they have options other than uh, what Yah has already created us mm. for, for such as male and female. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And polygyny will fix so much of that because like we talked about, you can homeschool them or you, you know, you don't even have to have a baby. How many people were molested by a babysitter? You know, you hear about things uh -oh. like that all the time, right? So you gotta, that's what monogamy only forces you to do. Things like that. We got another question here. It looks like it's for Pastor Dow. It says Isaiah four is now just being understood by the people. What, what say you Pastor Dow? I think that's the seven, seven women will say to one man. Is that the verse? Yeah. But uh, one thing that people miss about uh, Isaiah four and we'll go over there to read it exactly. It says, in that day, seven women shall take a hold of one man, saying, now watch this. This is the modern day woman. Saying we would, watch this, eat our own bread. In other words, we're going to provide for our own selves and wear our own apparel. Don't tell us how we're going to dress, how we're going to look. We're going to wear what we want to. Only let us be called by our name to take away our reproach. Reproach. See, what they want is they want the headship and authority of a man of a righteous seed. That's what they're looking for. They want a headship and authority of a righteous seed. But the big mistake in this is that here are these independent women that still don't want to be under authority, under headship. They still want to actually take care of them own selves, do what they want to do. Mm. And But then it says in verse 2, and in that day shall the branch of Yahweh be glorious, be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent in the coming for them that are the, the escaped of Israel. So we read it that way, but nowadays, if you're looking at today, you can actually get seven women that would actually be willing to saddle up with one man to take away their reproach, meaning that they, you know, all women want to have children. At least I'm not going to, well, let me recant that. It used to be a time. Used to be a when time. Women, <laughs> yeah. you know, desire to have children. Right. But just like we had just spoken earlier, when Elder Kabir just got finished saying, you look at the men that have lost the war, men that have lost the drugs, men that have lost um, uh, out here street violence, and and we can go on and on and on and on and on, and and we see all these people that lost. We're watching that now. We're up to a ratio about what is it like? Maybe eight or nine women to one man. One man, that's pretty much where we at. So, yeah, Isaiah 4 is happening and it's going to happen. 
And the Most High says, when it does happen, the branch of Yahweh will be beautiful and glorious. What does that last part mean about the branch of Yahweh will be? Does that have something to do with the second coming, or what do you mean? What does that mean? Do you know? It does. It's actually speaking prophetically. So it's, it's going to happen speaking before. prophetically in that day. Okay, so it's going to be. This is going to happen before the the second coming, basically. Exactly. I mean, remember what the book talks about. The book talks about the things that was it shall be again, and there's nothing new under the sun. Just because we've been in captivity by all these Western nations and stuff, don't mean that y'all's program is ever going to stop. We've been in captivity before, and we've been and Yah set us free. We've been in captivity again because of our rebellion and disobedience, and Yah set us free. And just before that coming, He's going to have a righteous seed. He's going to have a remnant that is going to keep His commandments, mm -hmm. and they are going to be the ones that have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates into the city. Mm. Man, I got chills. Well, I tell you what, I've done a lot of podcasts with some some pretty big names, and this has been my favorite. I mean, this has been great. I loved it. Hallelujah. Y'all drop a comment. Let us know what your biggest takeaway was. Everybody, you know, just drop some some thumbs up or hearts for Elder Kabir and Pastor Dow. Uh, Pastor, you, you're good to come on this debate with Pete Rambo and uh, one other? Yeah. Um, right now, I'm going to have to keep it up in the air because I'm, I'm in the window right now for a child being born. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I've been um, uh, it, it's getting close. You know what I mean? I uh, we we try to always make sure we have home births, but I have a certain window that I have to make sure I keep open yeah. so I can be pliable, if you know what I mean. But sure. I can keep the communication lines open if y'all okay. will with me, and we can go from there. Yeah, because they're they're gonna probably want to bring in a third person if I bring you in, which so I want to give them an, enough notice so it doesn't look like I stack the deck against them. But yeah, so what's me, happening? I mean, I don't know what's going on. So tell me, give yeah, me a little bit of lowdown. Sure, sure, happening. sure. I, I wasn't sure if you knew. So I basically I discovered the the truth about biblical polygyny probably about four months ago, three months ago. I started talking about it a lot on social media. Of course, my com my comments blew up because all of my audience. So before this happened, I wrote a book about sexual purity called why waiting works mm. here i was this ex you know bad boy started uh you know waiting basically because i thought god would give me a wife turned into a really long time made a viral youtube video so my whole platform got built around saving sex for marriage so you can imagine it was all women christian women yeah then god drops polygyny on me you, who's the last people that want to hear about that christian women, women. Right. They don't want to hear it. So I start talking about it and they're just hating me now. Like they used they used to like think I walked on water. Now they're just hating me, like attacking me, name calling, just vicious. And um I'm so but I'm sure I'm right. I got great discernment. God's telling me, yes, 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 nothing but peace. I'm like, I ain't gonna stop talking about it because I've seen the truth now and I know what it would do for the world if it was accepted. I had Pete Rambo on the podcast uh already, and basically I was like you know, I just issued a challenge. I said, if anybody wants to take us on, like I said, I, I wasn't, when I said us, I meant I was going to find a couple people that were smarter than me. Um, but I said, if any, y'all talk real big, if you're so sure you're right, come prove me wrong. I said, I got 41,000 subs on YouTube. Make, make, a, make a fool of us in front of everybody. And, and nobody accepted it for like days. Finally, one person, this guy named Pastor JD, Hall, uh, JD Martin, I think it was. He accepted it. He had a friend, Michael Holloway, who's also a pastor, who's an internet debater. So I want you all to know, like, at least everybody that's watching or listening, like, these are guys that are, you know, I didn't just get some schmoes. I got, these guys are ordained ministers. They know their stuff. They know their word. But I also am that sure that I'm right about this. So that they, it's indefensible. Monogamy is indefensible with the Bible. So Pete Rambo has accepted it. There's another guy named Bible Marriages. He won't show his face because he's going through something with his uh, marriage. I'm not sure. But those two have said yes. And then if you were to accept it, that you would be free. And I would give them a chance to bring on a third person as well. And I'm going to moderate it. It's going to be like everybody. get. I think one side, we're going to give 15 minutes to make your opening statement. Then they're going to get 30 minutes to cross-examine you and then vice versa. Or, oh. or maybe. That would be wonderful. I welcome that. I would hope. I would hope it actually takes place. I really, truly would. I'm not going to hold my breath though to think that it will. But I mean, I know a lot of people say they will. But a lot of times when people uh, do that investigation, I've had people from Dallas Theological Seminary say they would, and they turned it down. North Carolina, I've had pastors 
be so adamant, call here and leave their credentials and leave their phone number and, and say, let's do this. And once they get on the internet and find out what I've been pre preaching and teaching and watch a, a few of the debates I already have, they kick the traces. Myself and brother Pete Rambo, um, months and months ago, well, we put out a $20,000 challenge, which I upped it to a $30,000 challenge and asked if anyone I mean, just put it up and, and let's find out. Put your money where your mouth is. Let's get it going because truth needs to reign in the time yes. that we're in rather than opinions. Yes, We all may be entitled to our own opinion, but we're not entitled to our own truth. And yes. so, brother, if you can make this happen, that would be extremely nice. I welcome stuff like this. But y'all know what? I'm, I'm the type of person that I like doing this face-to-face -face in an audience with a moderator, but with this one, I definitely more than likely will make a concession. I definitely awesome. promise you. I can't wait. It's gonna be great. Let's let's pray that baby comes real soon or after. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that would be amazing. With they may be praying, please let it fall on the twenty first. <laughs> you know, that summer, they want the baby to come fast. Yeah. <laughs> Tell everybody how they can find y'all and what, what you know. KGB, where should they connect with you? And then straightway. Well, to connect to my channel is KGB ninety two uh, ninety four TV. Um, but we always promote uh, straight because that's I'm an elder at Straightway Truth Ministry. You can uh, find uh, Pastor Dow's channel, right? Pastor Dow, I think that's the that's the channel, Pastor Dow channel. Mm -hmm. um, and you can check us on our website, straight with, uh, straightway.com. It's really straightway, S T R A, like yeah, you can see right back there. Mm -hmm. Not uh, S T R A I T way, truth, straightway.com. You can find us there as well, our website. Do you stream your sermons on Saturdays online? Because I'd like to watch some of those. Yeah. Every single Saturday. Not only that, we have. We have a blog talk radio we stream every every Friday night. That's what the world calls it, Friday night. Every mm -hmm. Sabbath, uh, as far as you can go back, as far as probably uh, close to 20 years now, see the streaming service we've done. We do it every Shabbat, every single Shabbat. And plus I have uh, a quite a large following on YouTube as well and other platforms. Um, so just the name Pastor Dow, if you go there, you'll see me. And of course, you also see probably about 100,000 of my enemies too that all seem to hide behind mm -hmm. You know the screen and the picture that never come out and discuss have you know good civil discussions about topics like this because yes. you know we need to get to the truth yes yes and i was sending to you uh rob maybe the uh, when we have blog talk i mean it's today but I, I will send it to your your instagram so when when yes. it, i'll just send it there so you can kind of see and yeah. it's usually the same time after that so i got three questions for you pastor now first one when is the next feast and can i come yeah, you, you're more than welcome to come next week. Next feast, of course, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover. And um, I have to get, I just got finished approving of the calendar for the next calendar year. Uh, and I believe this year Passover is going to be the 20, somewhere along about the 24th of March. But I will I will get you the, the dates and the times concretely. You are more than welcome to come. More than know. welcome to come because you're going to see something that you have never, ever saw in the history of your life. Awesome. You're going to see not only a bunch of Israelites keeping the commandments. You're going to see a bunch of set apart holy men and women and children, all polite and proper. You're going to see a brotherhood and a sisterhood like you've never seen before. There's going to be extreme praise and worship of the Most High Yah. You're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to see literal demonic spirits getting cast out of people and watch people get set free right in front of your very eyes. And you're also going to experience and watch people get filled with the same baptism of the Holy Spirit that Yahshua spoke about, Peter spoke about, and Paul talked about. It's still here. You're, you're going to see all of that. It happens like clockwork every single feast. So we welcome awesome. you to come. I the can't fire, wait. The fireworks come from Yah. There's not, we don't put <laughs> lights and smokes. That's all Yah. <laughs> awesome. And then lastly, I, I got to hear your origin story, Pastor. I want to hear how you got to be where you're at now like what what you know just how you learned all this and how you you, you ended up being the man that you are leading this uh, straightway church not right now but i was wondering if you would come on my podcast in the future i would i would okay. man it's good to meet you good to yeah. meet you good to see you. i'll be um again all we have to do is just communicate and set it up and and i'll i'll literally be there and i'll break down uh my little life story how i started and how i ended up here and it's that's something to be said too <laughs> yeah, just because it'd be running what you just mentioned, what you just described to me, how you that must you must have some serious management skills to get to that. Like how everybody's just 
marching in line. Everybody understands the truth, like how you learned it. Like, I want to hear all that. So, yeah, I'll, I'll reach out. I actually reached out to you before when I first discovered this. I found some of your videos and I called straightway and I somebody called me back and they left them a voicemail. And then I called back and I think I don't know if I got I left another voicemail. I don't remember, but it just kind of fell through the cracks. But I wanted to, to bring you on. So, yeah, I, I'd really love to hear that. Yeah, I want to make sure you get my personal number, then. I want to make sure you get my personal number um, and my personal contact, so that way there won't be any room for the, the enemy may try to come in and try to divert it or something like that, so we can sure. actually get out here and get the truth out. The, the people really, truly need the truth. I love that. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, hey, Rob, if I can just say, too, uh, yeah. testify about Pastor, the way he leads and the way he lives his life and teaches, it attracts men. I mean, yeah. this, this ministry attract men because men follow strength, not titles. Yep. So, I mean, and trust me, me playing football, I've been around great people. But when I met Pastor Dow, I said, now that is a man. Yeah. A man of Yah. So this is not like I told you, I, I used to I have to change and say, okay, he's, he's not a coach. He's a pastor. But man. I would have loved to play football for Pastor Dow, man. I would probably break through some walls or whatever, but no. Nah. I can see that. That's why I think, you know, the church has been feminized, and that's why people are converting to Islam, because they at least they stand for something. You know, like, we, we don't stand for nothing in general. Not not we, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But absolutely, guys, this has been great. Uh, as soon as we get offline, I'll, I'd love to get, give you my number, and, and I look forward to bringing you back on. But thank you, KGB, or Elder Kabir, however I should refer to you. But this has been fascinating. I think people really loved it. And uh, I look forward to staying connected with you guys for a long time. Most definitely. Bro. All right, my brothers. So long, so long. Okay, guys, make sure you check out Straightway. Start ingesting the truth. I really do feel like a, this, uh, this is a message whose time has come. I believe now is the time to take the hill especially as it relates to biblical polygyny. I can see God's hands all over this and I believe he wants this truth out. So get bold. You know, I, I posted something in a biblical families group that we have today today. And it just said, you know, embrace the discomfort, you know, because you're going to probably take a little bit of heat, right? You're talking about this, but if you don't talk about it, nothing's going to change. You know, the world is suffering bad now because of this truth has been suppressed. So get it out, you know, talk about it. Don't worry about the attacks or whatever comes your way because it'll it'll be worth it in the long run. So just wanted to say that as a last a last thing. But love you guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Be sure to subscribe. Leave, leave a leave a, a comment with your biggest takeaway and uh, follow KGB and Pastor Dow Straightway Church. Talk to you later.